All right, everybody. Sorry for the delay. How's everyone doing? Let's get my headphones in here. Load up the views. Load up cameras. There we go. Hello. Welcome, one and all. Hopefully you guys are having a beautiful afternoon like we are here in California. It's sunny, gorgeous, hard to complain. Except that my camera is a little bent. Exodus, what's up, sir? All right, all right, all right. <laughs> exactly. Freaking love Matthew McConaughey. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, sorry for the delay. I was walking my dog, and he was taking forever. And then I got here, and OBX, which is like the streaming platform we use, or um, not platform, but program, was um, not being happy. So I had to figure out the right password, because they updated it. And it didn't save the previous update, so I totally forgot what the new one was. So I had to get that help. So, sorry. Get that fixed. And just reloading up my drivers because Wacom was disconnected and did not want to respond. Greetings from Texas. Greetings so much, 3D. I saw your um your little uh, annotation, your comment on my um, posts on Instagram. Yeah, thanks for coming. I'm a fan of Texas, and who knows, maybe one day I will immigrate there. <laughs> I'll migrate to a uh, neighboring, a nearby state. A couple good friends of mine are big fans of Texas and are there currently. Moving from California there, so we shall see. Anyhow, um, let's see where we were with this. Um, Okay, what's that? So I probably will focus a bit on the hair before we get back to the face and then I'll get the teeth in there, so. Oh, thanks man. Yeah, and it's even not my last piece isn't done. I just need to I need to get back to it. But I, I guess I was kind of getting bored, and then this was really on the back of my mind, and so I just figured I'd do something a little new and different. Mm. You were the guy telling me to check out Austin. Oh, okay, all right. I keep hearing people saying that like Austin's basically L.A. in Texas, and it's like I don't really want to go back into the same kind of environment. I mean, certain aspects are great, but like mostly weather, in my opinion. <laughs> Um, yeah, but I don't know. I don't want to be some player that's like too, too far left leaning politically, which is like California or a lot of California, a lot of LA. Um, I like a more moderate middle of the road kind of stuff, but I don't know. Is Austin, is Austin a bit more moderate? I'm just getting a, a lopsided view. I don't know. The eye and the brow bones. Whenever I'm sculpting through and watch reference, can you please demonstrate how to go about your eyes and brow bones? I can try, but I was using a um, I was using a um, scan here from the game reference that was like three dimensional reference, so it kind of was like helping me cheat. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can I can definitely see if I can show you guys some basics about um. About the bro, the brow, um, and Ofari. If you'd like, I uh, actually just posted um, a cool little uh, comparison uh, shot. I guess you could say progress of uh, my one of my first students, um, Tyler, who was uh, I guess he who found each other here at first. Um, he's a great kid, and he um, decided to take a, his first session with me, 
And the results, I think, speak for themselves. Like, if you see his work from before and then you check out his work now, and this was just, like, after a day or two. You know, we, we had one two-hour session together and uh, just helped him, you know, learn the basics of what I'm doing and uh, the fundamentals of, like, you know, the human face and, you know, tips and tricks and things to look for. And then also gave him, like, I, I forget, like, how much to me is just naturally intuitive at this point. It's just what I know, normally do in all the... Not just sculpting, I mean, but more so even like knowing the program and knowing where certain things are that are really helpful and convenient to help you speed along your process and kind of streamline just good habits to have as well. And a lot of like the buttons I have down here and um, tips and tricks of just how to, you know, knowing what to polygroup and um, understanding how to set up your reference and all that and like motto opacity and all that. So we covered a lot of territory that was um, not just sculptural, but also like helping you help yourself with the program, make it easier and smoother and faster. Um, so he gave me great testimony, he gave me a nice little, nice little paragraph. And uh, it's, it's on my Instagram right now. So if you want to, if any of you are interested or would like to get better at ZBrush and would like a bit more of a personal touch, um, as opposed to even what your professors or, um, you know, other professional courses you might take online and this one's something a bit more yeah just a bit more personal and personalized um that will help you i think proud to say like it really helped him i think you can see a big difference in his work um you know i would highly i'd highly suggest you try a session with me and see how you like it i think i think you might be pleasantly surprised um, and that way we can go more in depth and it's not so much just the work I'm trying to um, complete here, but, you know, we can actually look at your project if you have one or several and, you know, I can give you whatever kind of advice or quid pro quos, pointers, whatever you're looking for, we can, uh, we can go over in detail, you know, if you want to go for an hour or two hours or more, um, we can make that happen. But yeah, I'll try to see what I can do for um, your brow and the orbital, the orbital socket. Really, is what you're talking about. The um, your whole placement of where your eyeball goes, basically, and all the tissue that surrounds that. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, the human face is not easy. And while I'm not like the biggest fan of just doing people in general, like I usually, I don't really love doing superheroes. I'm not a big like superhero fan necessarily. Like I don't really. I enjoy the Marvel movies, but I'm not like obsessed with any of that or like screaming or dying to do any of it. Um, but I can do human likenesses and human faces fairly, fairly well. And um, something you just have to do. Um, it's like you have to know how to do it anyway, just to have just to survive in this industry, just to do work. If you want to be, you know, employable and not just be a creature guy um, or whatever. I mean, if you have the luxury of doing that, that's great. I would love to just do animals and creatures only, but. Um, I like doing a lot of realistic animals too. Um, I'm a big fan of nature and dinosaurs and, um, yeah. So, you know, I have my, I have my limits. I have my, my, my leans, my pickiness to some degree, but then again, too, beggars can't be choosers, you know? So, um, sometimes it's good just to be able to do a lot and to do it decently so that you can pay the bills because the arts are not always the luxurious um, cakewalk that people might make it seem or that just because you're sculpting that you're having such a blast all the time and nope <laughs> it's uh it can be work it can be really tedious sometimes and and that's what can defeat people i think some people can really become defeated by um the struggle uh that's present when you're trying to achieve a look or a likeness in this case and you go through some rough patches or it's just not looking right and you're really upset with yourself and the work that's coming out of you and you just feel like you really would prefer it to flow a little better or just to look correct um so i can help you with that i can really help you uh figure that stuff out so so all these brush strokes that are in the hair here this was all just quickly done like just super fast dirt and you know, quick and dirty um so i'm gonna smooth this out and we'll probably get a more correct flow for the hair coming in here but still it'll leave some general reference points so see some of the grooves still kind of left behind after smoothing mr reeves's hair
Houston is more like it then. Um, <laughs> what did I miss? I heard something about some new features. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not really doing many of the new features. I'm not using any of the new features really intentionally right now. I did upgrade finally. I did upgrade my version of ZBrush. I forgot it wasn't like a full new install. I, for some reason, my brain was telling me that it was a full install, but it wasn't. It's just an upgrade. ZBrush makes it, Pixelogic makes it great and easy for you to upgrade your version of ZBrush. They have a little, little application in their programs folder for the software called the Z Upgrader. And you just double click on that and it sort of seeks out through the internet whether or not there is a new version to upgrade to. And it um, does the work for you. It just says, would you like to install? Yes. Does it all. Doesn't You don't need to reinstall anything or do any extra like deleting and reinstalling of a new version. Like the upgrades just work, which is nice. Now I'm just using the move brush and uh, and using shift to smooth. And this is not how you do hair for a feature film, unless this person is like a million miles away and you just need something to represent hair. But otherwise, uh, this is only how you do hair, hair that you'd want to 3D print or that would look sculpted, you know, in some form. Um, obviously, this is not in any way how you would do hair for. Um, an animated uh, character that would be um, that would need flowing hair in any way, or moving hair, or hair that just looked real. <laughs> You're interested. Awesome. Okay, so um, Afari, if you'd like to just send me an email, um, I'll give you my email here. And anyone else, if you'd like to. Uh, schedule some sessions you can so just send me an email to linearts.com or you can dm me on instagram um oh yeah my handle on instagram yeah sorry for those who do not know my instagram it's daniel lion and arts so you can check out the most recent post is a comparison of um tyler's work before and after and then you can see the reference imagery that we used for the work he has now because she has kind of an odd, the interesting thing, because I gave him a choice of many different, I gave him a link that has a lot of different front and profile views of the same person, specifically meant for this kind of thing, for this kind of artistic training. And um, I just said, let him pick whatever head he wanted. And so she has a, this woman that he picked has a very interesting face. It's a bit more, uh, I would say more flat sort of in the front rather than projected outward. And um, the head also kind of has a bit more of a conical shape. So if you just look at the gray models, it might almost look a little cone headish, but it's not, that's not an accident. That's absolutely intentional and correct. Because if you look at them, the real the swipe to the left, and you'll see the second photo, and you'll see the work that he's done, the most recent work, and um, the uh, the actual um, person reference photos. You'll see the uh, profound, unique shape of her head. So that's the one he chose. But I mean, it's great. I think it's great that he chose something that's a little different and. It's it's good. That's something else I was telling him. It's like it's good to get out of your comfort zone whenever you're trying to really establish new habits, new good habits in software. And if you're doing something completely new for the first time, then it's all new and it's all out of your comfort zone. But in his case, he had already done a lot of head sculpts or, or tried to get them going in a place that he was happy and he just wasn't succeeding. Partly because I think he was he was probably trying to um, expecting too much of himself too quickly, expecting the sculpts that he was doing, the head sculpt he would be doing each day to be better just from starting from scratch every single day. And I was encouraging him not to uh, not do that, but rather, um, you know, focus on one head for several days and take your time. And uh, I mean, just in two days, and that's not even working all day. Of course, he's got classes and other work to do and a job. So he's got a lot of other things going on. So whenever, for whatever amount of time he was able to spend within two days, which I'm guessing is just, you know, a handful of hours here and there, the work is tremendously better um, from where he was at. And so it's just, um, it's really personally rewarding and, and fun to see, uh, you know, just one two hour session and, and he's leaps and bounds um, beyond where he was. And it, uh, you know, you wouldn't know from looking at one, one 
version of his work to his current one, like how much time you would think much more time had passed in between those two, but it was, it was literally just, you know, hours overall of work and, uh, some time with me. So it was cool. It was very, it was very encouraging to see, see his progress so, so quickly. Of course, results may vary. Everyone's different. Everyone learns differently, but, um, you know, take anything, pay attention, put your time and work into it and effort, and you should see, should see some good things quickly. But everyone's different too. Everyone's in different places, you know, as far as their education and, 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 and their familiarity with the software. So it will go differently according to who is where. But anyway, also, I just want to say publicly thanks to Tyler for uh, for giving me a little testimony and a shout out. And as a thank you, I'm definitely happy, and I told him this, uh, to give him a discount on any future session if uh, anyone decides to jump on board. So you guys can kind of scratch each other's backs, you know. Um, if you guys can, if you have a good time, a good session, you want to give me a testimony after we have a, a productive session, uh, I'll be happy to pass on the same discount to you guys knock off some cash for you guys so you can have a, a more affordable next lesson even more affordable <laughs> but uh yeah so had an interesting challenge the other day from a uh, potential client they live in iran of all places and uh iran and u.s have these sanctions against each other where we can't our banks can't communicate with each other at all. We can't exchange money directly between countries. So any bank that's in Iran can't send anything to a bank in America and vice versa. Excuse me. And I'm not exactly swimming in money. So I'm not doing the whole like, oh, I'm going to have a Swiss bank account. And uh, so um, we can't really find a, a third party. So if anybody knows of a means of uh, allowing people to um, trade commerce with Iran, uh, let me know between America and, and Iran. Because there's a guy who's a jeweler, a jeweler, um, and he was asking me to um, help him with some, you know, hire, to hire me to do some um, sculpture work for some jewelry that he'd like to um, 3D print over there. But he's not familiar with ZBrush, and so, you know, I was more than happy to take it on, except that we wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be able to receive any kind of compensation, which is a big problem. So. Uh, yeah, if anybody knows a way, I'm not sure if we can even, can we do crypto? Can we exchange like Bitcoin or Ethereum between Iran and here? Or is that even like shut down? Can they not access, um, like Coinbase or, you know, any of those, any of those apps that would allow you to exchange cryptocurrency? I don't know. So if anybody has any clues, please let me know. I'm all ears. I did some quick Googling here and there, but didn't find much, but also had a busy day yesterday and into today, so could do more due diligence. But, um, you see Yo, he's resurfaced. Yeah, man. Good to see your chats. Um, yeah, I'm doing fine, man. I'm hanging in there. Surviving. Um... You were a great tool, but family is more important. Um, okay, sure. I mean, I wouldn't be making a, a, I wouldn't be comparing those two. I think those are kind of apples and oranges. Um, <laughs> of course, family should be more important than pretty much anything else. Um, obviously, Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, I think crypto should be okay. I'm not sure. Okay. Just all the cryptos. <laughs> I recommend simple life like flower seller and relax loss heavy like some tech. Uh, with friends and family. Okay, so yeah, if anybody has any questions, though, um, feel free to ask. Yeah, I'm thinking crypto might be the answer, right? There might be a way to exchange payments. Just got to figure out how they can access, um, I guess, and send it. Mm -hmm. So I've got to probably find, I've got to look at, um, I think I have a shot here. It's like a profile image from 
that scene, I think. Uh, I gotta look here quick. So I'm thinking about his sideburns and just that area <coughs> of hair and how to properly sculpt it for this scene. I'm guessing his hairstyle wouldn't have changed that much between films. I know they're meant to look very similar. Um, but yeah, here's that side view. It's really blurry though, because it's in motion. And I don't know. I don't think this was a snapshot from the 4K. I think it's probably a snapshot from YouTube, actually. Um, it's so blurry there, it's hard to really see any detail. But I have the movie on my computer. Let me just get that scene up and see if I can get any more detail out of, like, I think it's the 4K version on here. I mean, I know I bought it. I just don't know if it downloaded the 4K or the HD. It says HD, so it could be either. Uh, play. Here. I think maybe the shot when he looks at Trinity when they when they're both like told to freeze that might be a good close up shot closer shot yeah alright so actually okay so it looks a little bit more like it's a little bit more combed down it's not quite so um, it's not a hard line of definition can I expand this? Oh, there we go. Okay. Getting a little lag here. I have so many tabs open in Google and Chrome, and I've got Zebra's open, and I've got iTunes open. Oops. Now, I know they're great about prohibiting snapshots, at least on your phone, which is so annoying because if you own the movie and just want to grab a screenshot, I don't know why they, I guess it's trying to curb piracy, but it's so annoying that they don't like take a picture of your own stuff easily. But let's see if we can do that here a little bit more easy on the PC. Oh, really? Do they just hide it? Oh, that's dirty. It's so irritating. Come on. What about the other snapshot? Does it sense that? Aha! The older version gets away with it. Think. <laughs> oh, come on. Seriously? Dang it. Um, see, that's why I got to go to YouTube, but then it's so degraded. Dang it, guys. Poop. Um, hmm. I mean, I could just do it like super ghetto and just do it with my phone and then email it to myself. But I mean, I guess it could work well enough. And yeah, but it looks so much blurrier. Well, I guess actually it's accurate, but it's still. I wonder if there's a better shot of him in this scene. Uh, it's closer, but it's like a three quarters angle. It's not side view. And every side, every like side view in this scene is like at a distance. You almost see full body of him like running. Don't want to get any copyright infringement by playing it because on stream because I'm quite sure that YouTube will have something uh, kick in and censor the video or I mean uh, demonetize it that kind of thing. And yeah, don't want to get anyone hit with a copyright strike. Uh, so just trying to scrub through here. Sorry guys, just one second. Um, for behind the scenes photos yeah that's a good idea too actually yeah i should do that um oh here's another shot okay so now it does look really clean cut 
it doesn't look like the other other shot it looked like a little bit more like they kind of gave it um i'm not forgetting the right terminology because friends of mine were hairstylists i had so many for years and i forget the like layer but not layered but kind of not feathered but like just a more like i'm not sure what the right term is but like and not a clean cut basically it was like a natural growth kind of just like you know give it a more choppy kind of look but this looks better i mean at least it shows me like the form like it is a very clean hard line right there like a very sharp 90 degree cut so uh, let's see if i can do this again do the work around just use my phone <laughs> so uh it's so uh analog in some ways hilarious but that gives me a good angle too of his uh hair okay. all right that should be good enough uh yeah i probably should google like behind the scenes lobby scene for the matrix check that out quick So what we're focusing on are the sideburns. And it looks like they're wider, like I have mine are a little too thin, I think, on his. So I'm just kind of looking in the image search here from um oh yeah that shot too when he when he's taking out the guys of the front gate um that's actually well, it's a bit more of a like downward angle but that kind of gives you a bit of a kind of a view too the thing one of the many things i love about the matrix is just how iconic so many shots are like you can pause it almost anywhere and it looks like a frame it's so well composed like i was talking about last week and week before is about just composition in general and filmmaking and how so many films don't have this level of like TLC. They just don't have this level of just care and attention paid to them. And uh, just the artistic composition and uh, you know, they just paid so much attention to Jeff Darrow's and other, whoever, other, whichever other artists worked on the comics that they had designed for their storyboards. Uh, it's just so well conceived and executed and they followed them very well oh yeah this scene duh this is a really tight shot duh i should have thought about that so right right before he goes in for the last for the triple kick that is what this whole sculpture is going to be of duh. all right let me get there quick um but so few films just i mean there's so many shots i'm looking at right now they're just it's so all it's just so well composed and so many films just are, are much more lazily shot and conceived and storyboarded and general and it just it's sort of like if you had to say of it think of it like a, a sculptural description it's like one's mushy like a lot of films are very mushy and not defined and then the matrix is like this hyper detailed almost per like perfect you know rendition of something like inhumanly detailed just the, the level of attention they put to everything is just amazing and I really kind of wish that they would have just taken more time for the sequels and perfected those because those feel so rushed by comparison. They're still great. I mean, in many ways, story-wise is the biggest thing where they just feel like they're, they're just you know, like cobbled together in some ways or just not as well executed nearly. Um, like they probably needed more time to establish certain characters and, and uh, concepts. Um, just in general, they just felt rushed, but, but, the first one just seems to have had such a great, like, gestation period. All right, sorry, almost there. And it fires, it looks, all right, there it is. Yeah, because that one shot that was in the image search was not useful. So there we go. So that's a good one 
So they're both a little different, I guess, too, from the right to the left, which, of course, is is um, completely normal. So I'll take a screen a <laughs> photo of this with my phone, and then I'll send this to myself. Um, and then I'll import it into here. There we go. All right. So that works. Okay. But yeah, I'm just a big fan of films that have just artistry really poured into them in the visuals more so than other films where they like I feel like this too, like when you can look away from a film for a very long time and know exactly what's going on, almost like you're listening to an audiobook or like a radio play, I feel like you're really not doing the medium justice. Like you're really not making a great film. If people can look away, can completely understand everything that's happening in the movie just from audible and just from an audio sound, you know, an audio perspective, I mean, and, uh, and they're not either feeling like they're missing out on something incredible or beautiful or meaningful, and or you're just not communicating anything that needs to be viewed, it can all be just listened. I think that's a bad film. I think there's a problem there, because you're not embracing the medium. I mean, I'm not saying that every sequence or scene or the whole film has to be something that has to be watched 100% in order to be understood. But I mean, you're working in a visual medium. So you should be the visual should be like extremely important, I think, and they should be taking precedent. You know, they should be really um, impactful, and that's what one of the many things I love about the Matrix was they did such a great job on making what you're watching incredible, and you value it. Like you don't want to look away, you don't want to blink because everything's just so exciting and so well done. Um, okay, sorry, one sec here. Just emailing this to myself. Favorite movie of all time? Yes. Oh, Nightbot sent a link. Oh, about that. Oh, that's for the, um, okay, so that's automated from us. Yeah, yeah, about Godzilla. Yes. Um, do, 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 do. All right, sorry, going back in the chat for a second. Uh, what's my take on NFT? Just curious. You have generally good insights on things, all things. <laughs> Thanks. Um, much live scenes. Oh, yeah. It's my favorite movie of all time. How is your most epic Matrix poster <laughs> moving with feed? Um, oh, you're asking about that behind me? You're asking, is it, how is it moving? Are you asking about the lights or, or what? What exactly? What exactly do you want to know? I bought that off of eBay. Okay, so yeah, the lights. Uh, so the lights, I kind of... The whole setup I sort of put together myself. So I bought the poster, which was like one of, I think, only like 300 ever made or something, or 600. Oops, sorry. There's a, a limited, very limited number of these these exact posters that were ever made. Um, obviously, like all of our major movie theaters back when the second movie came out. So it says, free your mind up there. This is actually for The Matrix Reloaded, but it really doesn't say that anywhere except really on a billing block in very small letters, so... And it's such an iconic, you know, symbol of the film. So I just uh, loved it. And I figured I wanted something that really showed the Matrix. And I have the original, too. That's like the um, the more kind of gray, purplish, bluish hue of them all standing kind of like what looks like a room. And, you know, Neo's in his full regalia. And all of them are in their, their, their get-up and their costume. And he's got like his, I guess it was like an M16 or... or um, yeah, I think it was an M16. Um, so I have that one, too. But... Um, just love this is so much more in a sense it's more even more iconic or just more of like the symbology of the of the the whole trilogy and the whole idea um but sorry so i bought the poster on ebay for like a ridiculous amount of money at the time i mean it's still a ridiculous amount of money to pay but it's like a limited edition it's like you know foil stamped um kind of like sort of like lenticular i guess like a foil stamped lenticular so it's beautiful even without any lights behind it or anything just any light hitting it will give you those beautiful like highlights and and um kind of holographic sort of look um so i paid like 600 bucks i think is what i paid for it like a lot it's a lot for a poster in my book um, but it's a work of art and it's also something that i intend to hang on to forever 
Um, so and then I've got a nice frame that has like these these hinges that open up. So you, you can like snap it open and then snap it closed when you inlay whatever you want. And it has a pretty transparent, um, not transparent, but like translucent um, backing. And also have like either glossy cover or matte cover. I think you can get those for like 200 bucks um, on or so on, e on um, Amazon. And then the LED lights are um, actually, they're lights that are, I just sort of affixed them to the back of the whole thing, but I had to like go back and forth and compare to align them with the, the code. So they wouldn't be in the black areas. Um, not that there's that much, but you know. Um, and sorry, what am I doing here? I gotta get the email for myself. And so I lined up the LED lights from um, some Christmas lights that I just found that do like the rain, they look like icicle kind of raining, you know, effect that we see everywhere all around Christmas time. And, uh, and that's, and that's what I did. So I put them back there and then just plug them in. And there you go. So really, a really simple way of doing it, just not cheap. I mean, I wouldn't call it um, a cheap poster by any means. That was the most expensive part was the art. Um, but to me, it was worth it. You know, it's a piece of moving art, lit art that I enjoy. One of my top three favorite films, probably my number two, Jurassic Park being number one, only because that affected my childhood so profoundly. But I think I was like, because this was 99, it was March of 99 when it came out, my birthday's in September, so I was uh, 17, 16, I turned 17 in September, so I was 16 when I saw this movie, and I'm now 38, um, so yeah, this was, like, I was at a form formidable age, like, I was at an age that was, this was, like, extremely influential to my perception of filmmaking, I mean, it affected everyone because it was like it's that's part of the reason why I love these films is, well, it's a byproduct of why I love them. They are films that are a post and pre era. You know, there's a pre Matrix era and a post Matrix era. And same for Jurassic Park. Kind of goes hand in hand with Terminator and Aliens was not as probably not as landmark, but great film. But um, man, it's blurry. Ugh. Um, at least we get. Left and right shots here, so interesting. Um, but yeah, I just there was such a there was such a difference between you know when the Matrix before the Matrix came out and after it did. Interestingly, too, Dark City. I know a lot of people kind of bring up similarities, like the interesting kind of overlaps between those two films. And I only saw Dark City recently, like two three years ago. I never had really watched it before, never even really thought about it. I've seen it advertised, but the cover just seemed generic whenever I went into like a video store when I was younger, you know, like Blockbuster or Hollywood video, whatever. Um, and as an adult, as an adult, I just forgot about it. Um, but I remember people making comparisons, and um, yeah, they have some very interesting stylistic choices that are very, it could be very similar. You could almost say that they could be sort of, a, sort of in the same universe. I think if you took out certain elements of Dark City. I don't want to spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it. But if you haven't seen Dark City, check it out. If you like The Matrix and you like a really dark, um, like in a sinister environment um, that's very moody and well done, um, Dark City is definitely creepy. And it's definitely got some elements that are for sure kind of, you could say they're cheesy, but they take it, they take their world so seriously and how they interact with everybody that you just kind of go along for the ride. Um, I'm still... You know, of course, way prefer the Matrix over Dark City, but um, it's definitely, it's definitely like, it's it's a trip. Like the film is definitely a trip, and you'll see common commonalities between the two, especially it's just the grungy, dark look and the the color grading that they chose, and the lighting choices that they've made. It's very interesting, very um, unique. And there's this shot. Like, this has to be on set, I think, of the first Matrix. Like, I found this a while ago. So that shows me, but it's it looks... It's like where this ends, like, you can see, we can use landmarks here. Like, we got that section of the earlobe. And here, this is definitely lower. So it's longer. So this is, like, different time period. Maybe this is for the sequel. I don't know. But he's got the same exact classes. 
it could just be mu maybe I don't know because for they were shooting for months. Maybe this is later, like one of the last later shots they shot. I don't know. Cause it doesn't say which was the first or second film. I feel like it's the first though. Um. Because that feels like that behind the scenes photo we just saw feels like it was taken around this time. And maybe his sideburns had grown a little bit more. I don't know. You know, whatever. Artistic license. Sorry, I'm wasting too much time just thinking about how long are his sideburns. <laughs> but I want it to be a great piece, you know what I mean? Like, I want this to really have the, that kind of attention to detail where it's just... Alright, I mean, so it's like, it's a general... It's a general clean cut, I guess. And this one's just a bit thinner. And this one looks a little bit wider, proportionally. Um, sorry, I'm missing some of the chat. I know you guys are saying something, but this is I, this is the detail I like. I'll go fanatically on things I I love, things I'm things I'm a fan of, a big fan of. I'll just go like crazy level of detail. Um. Sorry, so I'll get back to your question about NFTs, um, so much 3D in a moment. Um, do I have knowledge of 3ds Max? Not really, I'm sorry. I'm well aware of the program and I've tried to use it a few times, but it's so, its UI is just so much different and it's the way it works is much different. I know it can be very useful and extremely helpful in certain areas, especially with like distribution and randomizing of, you know, proliferation of, of different objects populating a, a scene with instances and that kind of thing. I know it has some really incredible tools, but sorry, uh, no, I'm not really familiar with the ins and outs of how to use Max. Um, best movies and games exist already. Now 3D job industry standards and job security condition is similar to cotton fields. Okay, for black slavery in 18th century. Interesting comparison. Not sure I'd make that comparison exactly, but, um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of just factory like mentality to a three artist industry where you churn out things very much in a very factory like mentality. I think that'd probably be a more better way, better analogy, in my opinion. Um, it's very manufactured. It's very prefab in a sense. You know what I mean? It's, it's creativity on demand, which is annoying. Um, but it's also like you're making a product, so it has to kind of flow in that way to some degree. Um, yeah, we're cogs in the machine, you know, I'll put it that way. Like a lot of artists now who are doing 3D work like this, we're just, we're like the extension of the directors or art directors, just make this and make it look like this. And we just sort of do a robotic dance to get it done, which is unfortunate that we often don't have, you know, but then if you want that kind of creative freedom, then you want to be more of a concept artist or um, a designer, but then you don't really get to make the final thing that you see in the film. So it's rare when someone like myself gets the opportunity to go from concept all the way through to final texturing and hand it off to the animator, you know, that, or if you're a full generalist and you know how to animate and rig, you know, I have to hand it off to the rigger actually, and then he hands it off to the animator. Um, that's a rare case though. And that also means you have a lot of luxurious amount of time, or at least they love you and trust you so much that they love the way you think and how you conceive of things, how you design, and then how that leads into creating a final, you know, animation ready model, um, which I'm a huge fan of doing that whole process because they do it for myself for a lot of things but it's rare that i ever get hired to do that unfortunately um, um but dark city was great love the art direction for that um what did i think of equilibrium i liked equilibrium but it also felt like it was so heavily inspired influenced rippy kind of not trying to rip off but trying to capitalize on all the things that the matrix did so it really felt like it was trying to be of a trend rather than trying to be original, which The Matrix definitely has so many elements that are of other films, like anything. There's no originality. In I know. The whole cliche that everyone loves to say is if they, no one's heard it before. Nothing's really original. I know. Everyone's, everything's influenced by something else. Uh, but still, when you have enough unique ideas or ideas that are developed so differently beyond what they were in the past, it starts to become something that's almost... It is, you could call it original, right? Um, so a lot of The Matrix feels that way because it is so... There's so much unique elements to it that are, you know, of the Matrix and that really gelled, like, you know, coagulated together very well. Um, 
So there's that. Uh, and I'm feeling a little weird about his nose now that I'm looking at... That's the wrong head. Looking at um, these side views. I feel like I could probably... His sneer, I feel like, is... A little, the nose is raised a little bit too much. So I'm going to fix that here. I feel like I put it up a little too much. Like the tip versus the um, bottom. Um, so yeah, I mean, Equilibrium was cool. I like Christian Bale. It's funny, like a friend of mine's visiting down here from um, from the Northwest, from uh, Washington. And she had never seen Empire of the Sun. If you guys haven't seen Empire of the Sun, which is this amazing fantastic Spielberg movie. Um, it's a film following... It's based on a novel. It's a film following the uh, story of a British family living in China when World War II starts and they um, they start concentration camps and imprison people, you know, largely based upon their... Um, you know, their civilization, their culture, whether they're Westerners, like Americans, English speakers. So Americans and British were all lumped together in one, you know, concentration camp. There were the Chinese concentration camps and there was actually like camp on camp thievery or, or violence, I guess, as well. But um, Christian Bale's a young child. He's a, he's a boy in that age and that time in the story as well, of course. And um, it's a fantastic film. If you haven't seen it, definitely watch it. Uh, but it's... Um, it's uh where was I going with that? Um sorry, lose my train of thought here. Uh Empire of the Sun. Christian Bale. So I guess yeah, I was just gonna say that he's a great actor. And uh that's one of his that's like his breakout role. Like that's what was introducing him to the world it was Steven Spielberg directed Empire of the Sun with John Williams score, and it's just like wow, that movie was phenomenal. Um powerful film. If you haven't seen Empire of the Sun, watch it on Amazon right now. I think you can rent it for like two bucks or three bucks. So if you don't own it, uh, definitely rent it. Soundtrack's amazing. Gorgeous. But like, you can't go wrong with John Williams. I mean, he's like the Mozart of our era, of our generation. It's incredible music. Beautiful choirs and orchestra and, you know, just classic John Williams. I have so many memories of that soundtrack, too, because my parents, my dad exposed me as, to, as he did with many things. He exposed me to so many great films when I was a kid. And he loves music. He loves classical music, especially, um, but all kinds. And he would he had, he got that soundtrack, and we would just hear that playing, uh, the music playing a lot throughout the house. And I just have very fond memories of that playing different times, especially summers. On the summer summer afternoons with beautiful music playing in our house. We're a very musical family. Like parents forced me to take piano and violin when I was a kid. So I had a lot of exposure to um, learning how to play instruments, but also of course listening to a lot of classical music. So I have a deep appreciation for all kinds of music, but especially um, classical and orchestral soundtracks. 20th century classical, all that good stuff. All right, so it's it's a struggle here because I feel like that's not matching exactly. Uh, I could probably pull it up a little bit again. I'll do a compromise in between the two. Because I also was watching, as I was scrubbing through the, the movie right now, I, earlier, I saw his expression really, it got a bit more intense here, and even the the wrinkles and the the folds in the skin and the forehead became even more pronounced, and then they relaxed a little bit more as his, you know, his, his muscles in his face tightened and relaxed, and um, so there's this, there's this variety, there's this like, you know, this gamut of uh, range. <laughs> I'm actually really itching to get the glasses on because I feel like it'll just make him look so much more correct in this um, model, in this scene. Um, but it's going to take a minute. All right. Let's have a look. I'm going to undo a little bit.
Semen. All right, whatever. I'll leave it as it is. Because obviously this expression is different than the one I was looking at too. When I was looking at this one, he's extremely relaxed in the face, like extremely zen, calm, in the zone. While this is a much more extreme contraction of the face by comparison. Um, anyway, okay. Moving on from the nose. Sorry, I keep going back to it. And I'm just like trying to get it to look correct. And I definitely got to move the gums and the teeth up. I know that looks kind of weird because they're kind of dropped. The gums are a bit too low and where they should be. Um, all right, we got like 59 people currently. Again, just a reminder for those who are uh, who came into the room a little later. Um, I just had a great session with um, one of my first students uh, the other day. And you can see the progress he made in a really short amount of time. So for those who haven't seen it or heard me mention, uh, just hop onto my Instagram, please, and take a look. If you're looking to learn ZBrush or looking to get better, um, if you're not happy with where you're at currently and would like to feel... Um, hopefully a bit more enabled to move quicker and faster in getting more comfortable with the software and um, learning some cult sculpt sculptural techniques or anatomy knowledge or creature design, whatever, whatever you're interested in, uh, let me know. Send me a message on Instagram or an email and we can schedule um, an hour or two hours or whatever you like. You can set up a weekly thing where I can help mentor you or we can um, just sort of, you know, Play it by ear, feel feel it out where you'd like to, for how long you'd like to go and where you'd like to, where you'd like to go in your artistic journey. So please feel free to send me a message. Um, sorry, I just missed a bunch of chat. Um, that was the very end of the film before he flies. Oh yeah, really? Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. You talk about the photo or whatever. Um, you can earn what, like thirty thousand per year, like in McDonald's or or uh, deliver driver delivery, um, plus health. Excuse me. Let's chair for eight hours. Yeah, I mean, I definitely have never made just thirty thousand a year for the work I've done. I've always made a lot more than that. Um. After 20 years of CGI, you will be older by 40. Um, what studio you asking for being proficient at Maya, Zebra Speedus Max, and the Toon Boom? Uh, isn't that silly? Right. I guess that was 10 years after. I could take it seriously for the images for 10 years. 10 years after, and I couldn't take it seriously after 11 images. Oh, yeah, I'm talking about Equilibrium. Yep, yep. Matrix did it. Yep, Matrix did it. Matrix did it. Yep, yep, exactly. A lovely movie. I saw it as a kid, blew my mind. Maybe look at white rice differently. <laughs> um Hello Luke. So I wanted to ask why are triangles hard to work with and is Z remesh is Z remeshing after big changes on any subdivision good? Please type the answer. Okay. Um I will get back to you in a minute, Luke. Um uh, I was really amazed when I Read today, expectation list on our local animation studio. Okay. Uh, a little bit of coding. Comics legend, what's up? Real working environment. In a real working environment, how long would you be given to finish this type of model? <laughs> oh, and texturing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How are you making the image show through the mesh? Dan with the plug. Yes, sir, Exodus. Um, <laughs> Got to. Uh, da -da -da -da. so going back, so he wants me to type the answer, dude. I don't have the time to type that long answer though. It's, I will say, where is that guy, Luke? Luke, what? Where, uh, Luke. Um, I don't know, Luke. Hopefully, you can hear me. Um, I'm not sure why you want me to type unless it's unless maybe you have challenge hearing, um, or your audio is not working well. But I'll say, uh, Luke, uh, Luca. So, Mr. Luca. Uh, 
Okay, so that's a question for Luca. If you can hear me or not, if otherwise just DM and we can I can answer that question offline because it'll be a bit long to type. Um, uh, da -da -da -da. So, yeah, Marcin, Marsan, um, Culpa. I think um, if you're getting offered that low rate, um, you should probably look into another studio or up in your game or something because you definitely should be paid. I mean. 30,000? That's nothing. That really, you should not be being paid that much, that low, for anything that, like, this kind of work at all. Um, yeah, you should be making, I mean, minimum, like, sixty to 70,000 to start. I mean, if you're a decent artist, you know, like, that should be, that should be your baseline, um, income-wise. And I don't know why everyone's so taboo about money. I mean, if you're more senior, and you have a higher position, you know, or you've been at a place longer, that should be up more. But there's, there are caps, you know what I mean? There are levels and there are places where they just won't want to pay you more. So you still, you know, you should make good money. Um, but 30000 is not good money for this kind of work. Um, you know, I mean, depending on where you're at, too. I remember on the East Coast, where the cost of living is much less than here, like almost half. You know, so I was, I was, you know, making like half of that, almost. I remember my first gig as a, as a I guess you categorize me as a junior artist then. Um... You know, I was making around 40000 to start. Um, but that's still pretty good in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which that equaled out to here in L.A. That would be at least around like eighty grand, maybe a little less, like 78000 So, again, and that's like starting, like that's your starting rate. It's your starting um, salary. So, you know, not not too bad. Um, you know, definitely as every, as every year has passed, except for 2020, my income has definitely gone up. Um, 2020, everything just took a crash, unfortunately, but, um, but yeah, so, you know, but that price should, that probably will reflect either on the work you're showing and being asked to do, or the kind of company that you're approaching or that you're looking at for work. And either way, that doesn't speak well for either party. So either it means that the company is totally lowballing you and you should just ignore them, uh, or it means your work needs to improve and they don't value your work as a, at a standard, a more standard rate, a more fair rate. So questions to ask yourself um, and look at the situation to evaluate. Um, but yeah, just trying to look out for you guys because everyone should be making decent money if they're doing this kind of work. If they're not, you're being screwed over and you should kind of tell them, kiss your ass and walk away. <laughs> um, don't actually say that. Just, you know, attitude. Just say, thank you for your time, but I'm good. And move on. Um, kill him with kindness. Um, anyway, um, so how am I doing this? So model transparency or model opacity is this really crazy cool hidden feature um, that took me forever to even learn about. Um, here's a little party favor for you guys. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it's right here. There you go. So texture. Drop down to image plane, in image plane, open up reference views, and there here almost at the very bottom, it's hidden, is model opacity. There you go. So that lets you increase or decrease its transparency, allowing you to see through it to the image behind it. Conveniently packaged with image plane, which is how you load in the image behind, you know, reference image behind your model. Like that. And then you want to create custom cameras that lock your camera once you've aligned everything correctly that is over here in document right here in z link z app link properties and then you have custom one and custom two you can save those views right here so then later you can load them so once you reload your your um, um, project or your single sub tool whichever you want to do but you should save the project so then it saves the image in the same place so everything's linked up so everything's in the same place um, yeah, and then I just, you know, customize my UI to bring them out here to put everything where I, you know, will use it because I frequently use all these different, uh, settings, so, um, so I feel like this area too, like in the forehead, I feel like this could just be amped up a little bit more, and one great thing is Ryan's Tools. If you guys haven't heard about Ryan's Tools, definitely um, pick them up. You can find Ryan's Tools on Gumroad. Just Google Ryan Kittleson ZBrush 
I think, and that should bring up Ryan's Tools, or just type in like Ryan's Tools, ZBrush, Gumroad, and you'll find it. I think it was like two bucks, three bucks, five. I don't know. It was really cheap, and uh, you can you can get this plugin, which just edits some of the settings. It helps you do different settings and refine your subdivision and do amp detail. He has this brush in here that's incredible. Um, that's just amp detail. And so I believe I saved that down here at one point, or maybe it was another UI setting. But anyway, selecting this brush um, lets you amplify in both directions. So if you have something that's recessed and something that's um, uh, what's the opposite of recessed, I guess embossed or, you know, relief is, is um, whatever the opposite of recessed is, <laughs> is a more um, convex shape. It will amplify them in both in both directions. So you'll get more detail amplified, hence the name of the brush. And so for instance here, let's say we can look at how this looks right now like this. And I guess I could just brush here as, oh, auto save, hang on. I could just take this now and go over here and you see how it's going in all directions. So it can be a little bit too much. So I'm gonna like go back and then, um, Turn on back face mask, and I think that might reduce the recessed and bring it down to like one. And let's see now how this looks. I should probably go up to the highest subdivision too. All right. Requires valid morph targets. What? I don't need valid morph targets. What are you talking about? Why does it need valid morph targets? Or is it because the back face thing was screwing it up? That was a weird. Or is it because it's looking at a higher subdivision level? I wonder. Hmm. That was weird. Unless it's having a glitch. Because it worked in the first moment and then it stopped. So like smart subdivision here, awesome. It's such an awesome um, and super smooth. It's another great feature. There's so many good features here in Ryan in Ryan's tools. I don't really have time to show it all right now, but um, if you're using ZBrush and you don't want certain things, so start, I'll give you an example. Like smart subdivision is great. So if you want to subdivide and you want it to smooth but not constrict, not contract, like a lot of times you'll normal subdivision in ZBrush makes things shrink a bit, so they come within their own volume slightly. Smart subdivision keeps them where they are and just smooths out, not out, but I mean smooths the surface. So you don't get shrinkage, you don't get contraction. Um, so like, I guess here's a, here's a generic human model, right? Generic human male. Uh, so with regular subdivision, see if you can watch it here, maybe this will help. Um, you hit subdivide and it's gonna do that. But now if we do smart subdivision, you don't get any contraction, any shrinkage in the face. Probably not the best example, though, actually, because it's not seeming to show that amplification enough. Um, I think of something else here. I'll do tool, polysphere. I think this might be an example. This will be a weird example, though, because I remember when it, when it does this for polysphere, it looks a little different. Um, I can show you guys this quick because it's it is really useful. Um, so regular subdivision, look at the volume where it's at right now, and then I hit this. Oh, I'm gonna delete higher to. Um, we get some shrinkage. You hear where it is, and then you see how it's it's dropped a bit. But now if we do smart subdivision, you can see how it's holding. If you look at the very top of it, right, the very peak here. You can see how it's holding its form. It's its actual volume is staying the same. While if we do regular subdivision, it shrinks a bit, contracts. And that can be really annoying if you have your low cage, your you know low poly model positioned very well, and you have your eyes placed in a certain area or whatever. You have everything where you want it that are intersecting with each other, but you don't want them to be any interpenetration where they start to shrink within one and expose to something that was internal and it's just a problem, then you have to pull everything out again and like fix it. Smart subdivision cuts that problem out completely and just lets you retain your volume 100% while smoothing. So awesome, I don't know why they didn't keep, they didn't make that a thing from the very beginning, but the tool exists. So go get 
Ryan's tools. Free plug. I have no profit from that. <laughs> Other than just to help you guys, because it helps me out a lot. And uh, yeah, his stuff is great. He also has like all kinds of other things in here. I mean, you just got to go and check them out. There's just like, you know, yeah, smart subdivision. Um, I mean, you can trash things in a different way and get rid of things from your tool palette. Uh, start super smooth is great. Anyway, just so much good stuff. Go check out Ryan's tools. Uh, so I'm wondering why this brush is not working though. Oh, well, I guess we're just gonna have to forego that for now. And another, another brush that's similar would be the form soft brush. Which will amplify subtleties, which is probably better for this actually, because when I was using the other one, it was kind of too harsh. But this will uh, amplify. Whoa, too strong here. Something's going on. I wonder if it's the setting in here that's. I don't know, because it seemed really strong, way stronger than it should be. Anyway, um, hair, doing hair, doing hair. And what am I missing? Sorry, I know there's a bunch of stuff that came through. Um, in a real working environment. Oh, so yeah, so Comics Legend, you were asking, how long would you be given to finish this type of model? I mean, it depends. Are you talking about a model like this to 3D print for a product? Or are you talking about um, for animation, for like a film, for digi double, um, but generally, so I'll give you an example, like the um, Samuel Jackson model that I did for, uh, I, I was working on that around Christmas time. I'll show you quickly uh, for um, Verizon, it's this big Verizon commercial, and I was really glad to have been asked to do it. Um, so uh, this gentleman, the famous and one and only Mr. Samuel L. Jackson. Um, was hired to do the commercial and do all the acting voiceover and everything motion performance capture all at once which was really cool so um for this model i'm not going to play the commercial right now but um so this is where i'd like to take keanu's model basically to, to this level um but i'll actually even sculpt in a bit more finer detail because we had a groomer so he doesn't have eyelashes or like stubble because that was someone else who was going to add in those extra details so, you know, we're part of a big moving moving machine, a big team. Everybody has different roles, and we all have to work together and fast. But that also keeps the max... We're hiring experts in different departments. That's what, you know, smart studios do. So you maximize the quality also with the amount of time that each one can invest in it. So for me, they gave me two weeks, which was still pretty tight, which meant 10 days, right? No weekends. So 10 days to get this from basically, you know, a base mesh, and they gave me a great scan, like going to do with Keanu. So they gave me a scan of him. But it was not animation ready at all. You know, it was pretty well done. Pretty good scan. It was from Legacy. So credit goes to Legacy FX. I love those guys. Huge fan of John Rosengrant, Shane Mahan, Chris Swift. All those guys and gals are fucking awesome. They're epic. Um, they are like childhood heroes of mine, for sure. Because of everything. Jurassic Park, Terminator, Aliens, Predator, you name it. Um, the list goes on for like everything. They're nuts. Um, E.T. They redid E.T. for like this incredibly touching, way more emotional commercial than it should be. For um, E.T. at Christmas time. Look up like the E.T. Christmas commercial or something. It came out like a couple years ago. Incredible work. Anyway, um, so they're just incredible guys. And so I had a great base to start with already. All right. And they also had like a very basic form of the jacket and some like lining. So I had some stuff to, to run on already. But even then, all the work that had to go into this, all the extra texture work and all the extra detail in the face and rearrangement of things. Like, there was a lot like the hat didn't even exist you know like so much extra stuff had to like be done and finished and ready to look photo real um or close to photo real and they gave me some like reference you know of course they gave me some reference photos of what they liked um that someone else did as like a pre a pre sort of concept sort of idea for what they wanted the look to be and that was approved so they had to stick to that so there's a lot of a lot of extra work that had to go into this um for sure but anyway uh so two weeks um is i think just barely a fair amount of time. Obviously more time would be better. So it would be way more comfortable to be able to do this work in like three weeks or a month. And depending on certain deadlines and who your clients are and whatnot, they might give you more time if you're at a studio 
and they say, you know, we want um, so and so working on it, and you know, our, the firm deadline is like two months from now or a month from now. You know, we prefer you get it done in two weeks, but if you need a little bit more time, great. Um, so I would prefer that, but uh, you know, so yeah, two weeks is about average, I would say. I mean, I had that a lot for other other work too, so it can be done. Um, but it also just depends on what the project is and all the extra, you know, accessories or, you know, regalia that they're wearing, like how much more stuff do you have to create? Um, then you have to be smart too, you know, so sometimes it's about, sorry, sometimes it's about working smarter than harder. So you might want to go to Turbo Squid, which all of us do, uh, to grab a pair of sunglasses that's already made by someone else who's good at what they do, hopefully. And hopefully, you know, you can see the wireframe, you can see what the UV layout is. Is it at 4K or is it at 1K or 2? Um, you got to evaluate all those things before you buy a model, you know, or if it's free, that's awesome too. Then you take it and it's usually not exactly what you need, but again, it's like a good base. It's a good starting point. And then you modify it and use it as, all right, 80% of the work is done or 50% of it's done. I take it the other rest of the percentage and complete it to make it look this like this exact, you know, specific custom characters, sunglasses or whatever, you know, whatever you're buying jacket or shirt or whatever so um you got to be resourceful when it comes to this because the, the clients don't care you know that if you're using something that's purchased that's available that's legal you know that you can buy and then use and repurpose commercially that's fine you know it's all about they're not really in the end while you might be paid hourly if you're smart and then you understand how the system all works they're not truly in the end they're not paying you for just your time i mean they should be doing that of course but more so they're paying for your expertise so if it takes you five days to do something that they're scheduling and budgeting for two weeks, you should still be charged for the two weeks because your expertise is what's allowing you to create the excellence that they want. It's not just their time. You know what I mean? Like a junior artist wouldn't be able to do it as well or as fast as someone who's more senior, typically. Um, so they're really paying for you for your knowledge. You know what I mean? Like some people will, I mean, I, there's anecdotes out there of people who are experts in something and they charge what seems to be a large amount of money for something that the client expected it to take a long time or to be um, very strenuous or hard to figure out. And then the expert gives them their answer and it, it's a solution that moment, you know, it, it'll either instantaneous or like one day, you know what I mean? Like or something really fast. And then the person's like, why are you charging me so much? Or I shouldn't be paying you that because it happened so quickly. And the response of course of the expert is you're not paying me for my time. Really? You're paying me for my expertise. You're paying for my knowledge. You're paying for years of hard work, study and, honing of skills which is what enabled me to give you such a quick and immediate answer or such a great result so fast so you know money exchanging hands for people who are experts at what they do it's often you know and they have to make a profit right they have to eat so there's that too but um there's something to be said for being an expert or being proficient at something and then charging what you're worth and knowing what you're worth and being able to back that up uh because a lot of people often want to degrade or you know subtract from what you may know to be true or what you don't know is true, but you should be, you know, aware of. Um, so you got to know your value, got to know your worth as an artist, as a creative, that's extremely important. And a lot of people get taken advantage of, even like myself, I got screwed over uh, recently by a client that um, I could take the small claims court if I really wanted to. I still can, because um, I'm in the right, the work was done and they didn't want to pay after they told me the fact that um, they wanted it sooner than when they told me, but they just said sooner than later. They give me no firm deadline ever. No paperwork was ever signed showing anything of their um, time frame, And um, they just wanted to be assholes in the end. And uh, it really pissed me off because it's a fair amount of money that I'm out now. So I'm looking to repurpose some of those as NFTs <laughs> to make back some of the, maybe more money than what uh, they owed me um, for the work that was done. So I got, there was like three three copies of one sculpture and they got one copy. I mean, they gave them all three originally and they're like, we don't want to pay the other half that they owed. So I said, well, you can't keep all three products then, or I could just take a small claims court and crush you because it's an easy, it's an easy win. I mean, it's it's really not hard uh, legality here. It's not hard leg le um, um, what's the word I'm looking for litigation. So um, so they gave me back the two of the three, and I'll have to try to turn them around so that I can. Um... So if there's any sports fans out there, any Michael Jordan fans, any Air Jordan fans, I'll have something that might really interest you. It's a pretty, I think it's a pretty cool illusion sculpture. You view things from one angle, it looks like a certain symbol. You look at it from another, it looks like a certain sneaker. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, pretty unique. And it's physical. So it'll be a digital image you'll have as the owner of the NFT, but you'll have a physical sculpture that's an actual one of one. There's two of them, but they're both different. They're both unique. 
So any basketball fans out there, anyone who knows anybody who's won, tell them to keep an eye on my Instagram. I'm going to put together some pretty badass NFTs for those. And my own first real personal original NFT will be a Raptor centric one that I think will hit home for a lot of people in a good way. And it'll be really fun. Um, so I don't want to say, I don't want to spoil the surprise. I don't want to give away what it really is because I don't want anyone else to try to do it either <laughs> first. Um, but I think everyone will recognize it, know it, love it, and hopefully it'll do well. So anyway, that so that kind of killed two birds with one stone in my answer. Telling the story um, come kind of comes full circle back to the question that um, so much 3D had about, uh, had about um, NFTs. My view on it is... Dude, strike while the fire's hot. Jump on it. There's no reason why people shouldn't be making some good money right now, especially during this whole hellish year. Um, oh, crap. I was sculpting the wrong thing. Um, this half, this past year was just hell, right? I mean, all of us lost money, or at least a lot of us did. I mean, you know, some people turned out they had a great year um, in 2020, but I didn't, and a lot of other people didn't. Uh, it really sucked uh, for a lot of people. Um lost uh the gig i was at as they let a lot of people go right around the start of covid which sucked and um got really sick and then i hurt, almost like broke my leg i like tore muscle my my soleus deep in my calf muscle couldn't walk for like half the year really sucked so i was i mean i guess it was sort of fortuitous that if it had to happen at one point it happened when we were all stuck at home anyway so at least i had to ambulate a lot but i have a dog so that was still hell. Like, I had to walk out every day, hobble out to walk my dog to let him do his business. It was rough. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, I think NFTs are a great way for people to make some decent money. If you can figure out a way to create some great art that people would love. And you got to figure out the NFT space, though. It's really a weird, not... Um, like, a lot of artists that are making good money are also making money because they're known and liked you know, or followed a lot. They have a lot of following. So it's not necessarily that the quality of the work is better than someone else's because there are some artists who are great artists who aren't selling stuff. They're not selling, even though they have it on NFT, they have it available. People aren't buying it. And it's either because they don't have enough of a following or it's just, there's a certain lean and style that people like that's a little bit more meme related or a little bit more abstract art or combination of the two. Um, and or they're just famous, in which case the work doesn't matter how bad or good it is artistically. It's just they have a name, they have a brand. People love that and want to own the original something of, that they made. You know, so it's a weird space. It's a really odd, different space that I think um, the code is still being cracked in the sense that there's not one style way or thing that will be like a definite sell. But I think people should definitely be looking into trying their hand at it. It's a bit of a gamble, but the results could be, you know, I'm a big of a, I'm a bit of a calculator risk taker. You know, I like, I'm not afraid to be bold with some things and risk something for a benefit that may be, you know, more surefire than like the lottery or like getting struck by lightning. You know what I mean? Like stuff that's a bit, that has a higher chance, better odds, like, you know, investing in stocks and companies that, you know, are going up eventually, like. Trying to be smart about my investments, of course, but um, I'm still like somebody who's willing to to gamble a little bit on some things that will have a good return, um, have a high potential for a good return. So anyway, right now I'm just sort of tracing the lines I see in his hair. The, the standout ones is like guides for um, doing more uh, hair work here in a minute. And it's like I keep looking at the subdivision and the the um, striation happening here by the way that the flow of um, geometry is. And I think I might Z remesh this actually before we go much further. So it's at 260. It doesn't need to be much lower than that. So we'll start here and Z remesh. Um, so if Luca can hear me, um, if he doesn't want everything typed up, the question about Z remeshing, if you want to do it at subdivisions, I mean, you'll lose your subdivisions. So you won't have your tier to go up higher and have more detail and go lower and get less. You're going to be set at a new baseline. So when you zero mesh, you recreate the mesh. You lose your UVs because the, vertic the vertices count and their name and or their numbers and association with each other are all altered. So it's, it deletes any UVs um, because UVs, of course, need those vertex coordinates to create a flat image that you can wrap around the object. Excuse me. And so... Um, Z remesh is really kind of starting fresh in some ways. So you really want to do that at the beginning before you do UV, before you get too far even in subdivisions. You want to, Z remeshing is to create a better, um, 
uh, set of edge loops for your model, right? So it's a distribution of polygons and how the lines that form the polygons flow. So like with an arm, you always want think of it like bracelets going one direction and then lines like fishing line, you know, going around the other direction, 90 degrees opposed, you know, in perpendicular to your, like if you were to chop up the, the arm into like a sushi roll, <laughs> those are all going, the edge loops are all completed rings going one direction, not spirals, because there used to be um, old Z remesher algorithm used to create spirals, which is annoying and it's not what you need. Now I think it creates proper edge loops. Um, rings sorry i'm showing my arm to myself but i'm not showing you guys rings going around your arm right the whole way the length of your arm and then fishing line or think of our long rings going lengthwise around the whole thing and then they have to collect here and have more concentrated for the fingers sorry i gotta put my hand in there and then you know edge loops going around your fingers like this like rings as well so you got to think of edge loops and distribution as a necessity for both good sculpture and deformation of the model and also in turn the same thing if you're going to bend the arm you need to have good edge loops for animation as well because it needs to be able to bend and deform where like your elbow right this whole area here comes around that has to be able to deform like this right and you won't be able to have the able you won't be able to have the arm curl like that and have a nice crease in there if you have triangles and lot or just lines and edge loops going in weird directions then it'll pinch those edge loops and they'll be like odd like triangular points that come out in different angles and it won't deform correctly so you need edge loops going in the right flow so that where your arm is it bends and it will deform the polygons nicely um, so that's the importance of your polygonal distribution and your edge loops um, and also density right because a lower dense mesh you won't you'll have less edge loops right you have less polygons because you have less edges forming them so if you don't have an, an edge loop right here where your arm bends. If you don't have an edge loop here and here and here to delineate this flow of the forearm, you're just going to have either sharp, weird angles or or just a flat, you know, really no real like hump for the uh, for this forearm muscle for this um, extensor. Um, so you're going to have all kinds of problems if you don't have the right amount of minimum polygons. And if you have too many, then you're going to have hell to try to rig and animate that because it's too dense. So that's the importance of understanding also your mesh density. You want to have that right happy middle ground, which is always getting a little higher as computational power gets uh, increased every year. Uh, you can always go a little bit higher in general with your um, characters, but you still don't want to go too high because it's not necessary a lot of times and it will create hell for a rigger because um, that means there's so much more work that they have to look over and make sure um, that certain weights are painted correctly and that you know, certain vertices are bound to the right bone. And um, I don't even know all the details of rigging. I just know enough to know like what they would like and what they don't like. Um, and I really need to keep learning rigging. Um, I'm going to get back to that. So anyway, um, that's a quick crash course on the importance of edge loops and what Z Remesher does. And now we're going to do Z Remesh right now to redo the topology here. Um, because as, if we can just zoom in on this quick, let me put opacity up. You can see it's dense and the edge loops, I want ideally the edge loops to follow like the flow of the hair, just like an arm, right? Not that I want it to bend, but I want it to be able, to, I'm essentially bending the polygons or the set of them by sculpting, right? I'm creating curvature, I'm creating form. And so you want your form to flow with the edge loops or vice versa. You want the edge loops to flow with your form. So in this case, I don't want edge loops doing this. See the lines I'm drawing are these straight lines going back and, or they'll irradiate, you know, they'll, they'll do this across spreading out from the hair. So I want edge loops to flow in that direction and perpendicular to that direction, right? And right now they're doing this crazy S curve right here. You can see here, they're coming up and then going this way and then going that way. They're meandering like snakes doing this, all right? And then the same can be said for this, a little less so, but still you can see here this flow of coming down and then doing this. Some of that's with the form and some of that's against the form. And so when it's against the form and you, you know you don't have enough edge loops or you don't have them in the right place, especially, you get this effect. I'll turn off the color. This, this, this diamond shape squishing and folding. That's where you have improper edge loops for the flow of your model, right? And that's where you get this deformation that's improper because they should be ideally, like if I wanted my, if I wanted my edge loops to be the way they were, they would correlate to the sculpture, which should look more like the flow of them. So the sculpture, the, the indentation here should flow like this. See what I mean? It's following the flow of the lines. So you'd get less distortion, less like bizarre 
pointy, incorrect shadows and everything falling where they shouldn't. So that's like a really fundamental basic point of good topology, which I'm sure many of you know. So I'm sorry for um, boring anyone who's like, we know this already, but there are those who don't. So this is mostly, of course, for them. Uh, so edge loops and flow is important. So ZBMesher looks at your topology, kind of does a scan of the whole thing very quickly, and then evaluates the flow and attempts to uh, machine learning tries to, or basic machine learning tries to evaluate through an algorithm curvatures, angles, and then provide a redo of the topology to conform to the flow of whatever object you're looking at. So in this case, we're looking at a mushed up sphere. Um, and so it's going to create edge loops that hopefully you'll see, like back here, even here, it's like, yeah, they're okay, I guess. They're a bit more fine for this in the back, but they also had less movement going on because I wasn't adjusting the back here as much um, as the flow at the front. So we should see a pretty drastic and cleaner alignment of uh, polygons here in one second. So we're at 260, and we don't have any curves and adaptive size. Um, you know, bring it down a little bit to like 30-something. And target is 1,000, so we have 5,000 target. Obviously, there's going to be more than that, but we're not going to put this up to 100 because we don't want to try to go over 100,000. It's just way, way too much to try to tell to reevaluate. So let's go with 10, see how that looks. Um, detect edges is usually more for like sharp objects and sharp, ed sharp edges. I don't think of this as very sharp at all. Obviously, it's very mushy, very soft, but sometimes it can help even with something that might look soft but has some sort of areas of harder lined indentation. I don't think we need it for this. Um, you know, And we don't really need groups necessarily because it's not perfectly... Uh, polygons aren't perfectly distributed in a clean line along his delineation of the um, part. So um, it's like a semi-part. It's not really that clear, but it's sort of there. Um, or looks like it's sort of there. So we'll leave that alone. And we'll just click Zero Mesh and let it process. So it's going to look at what your target was set to and what you already have and kind of do a compromise, you know. Not sure how it really chooses that because I don't know the ins and outs of all the Z, Z code, Z script. Whoa. So it's looking here at this circular indentation, kind of ovoid. Excuse me, I'm starving. I haven't had much tea today. Um, so you got some good flow here, but you see this, it's looking at this kind of widow's peak ish sort of, you know point in the hair, which I think is actually probably a little too strong on mine. I feel like it looks like it could be a bit more of a straight line rather than um, so pointy. Um, so let me, uh, let me adjust that. I mean, it just feels odd. It feels like it's off. Oops. I mean, some of that shadow too, but it still feels like this could be brought, this should be brought down more. Or like things should be matched up differently. So I'm sorry, I know I'm missing, I'm missing probably chat, a bunch of chat. Yeah, like this should definitely come back up. See, like this should be, I think that's already better right there. Like even just that, uh, I think I let it go down way too far. So again, I'm using alt and move and dragging. So it's pushing it along the normal instead of going like this. If I was just using move and doing the same motion, it would go up like that. But because I'm holding alt, I can move it inward and outward along the normal of the polygons instead of, so it's following the angle of the polygons instead of following the angle of the camera, which is like for us up and down, it's just up and down. But for this, if I move up and down, it's going inward and outward along the relative angle of the um, facing polygon. Um, polygon face, I mean. Um, anyway, sorry. Um, what have you guys been saying? Um, is it acceptable to use insert brushes to compensate for a lack of skill for, say, hands? Um, is it acceptable? I mean, it depends what you're doing. Um, I would say you, what you should do, I mean, it's acceptable if you can blend it into, you know, like connect the topology cleanly 
Sure. I mean, the quickest way to get from point A to point B is fine, generally. But you should be able and confident enough to be able to edit the hands you've used, whether there's someone else made them or not. So if someone comes in and says, oh, the fingers are too short or they're too fat or they're too whatever, they're not enough wrinkles, they look too young, too old, whatever. You have to be able to edit that model and be competent and be able to confidently be able to edit those hands in whatever way that someone might ask you to. Whether it's the fingernails, the cuticles, you know, every little area. You have to be a confident enough of a sculptor to be able to edit that if and when you're asked. Because odds are generic hands may not be exactly what some character needs. If you're doing a stylized character and you have generic hands, you're going to have to fatten those fingers up. Um, maybe delete one. You know, if they have like four fingers instead of five or add one if they have more. Um, you have to stylize it, meaning like you have to understand the shape of a finger. How have a bit more flat on the top, but then it kind of curves and then it, it like drops sideways and then it kind of curves underneath. And then the creases and where the joints are and how they deform. You're going to have to... <clears throat> have some knowledge in those areas so while you might say oh it's a shortcut just to throw an insert mesh hand which is just a you know for those who don't know insert meshes are what they sound like you have a mesh a model of something and you can just insert it you can just drag it out like grow it out of whatever you're working on like almost like a tree growing out of the ground and then it's sort of in the same layer it's on the same subtool but it'll mask the one that you grew it out of so then you want to separate those two so it has a separate object or at least attach it and fuse those you know edge loops together from one part to the other, but then you're losing your UVs if you have any UVs already. Um, so, you know, that's all the early modeling stage. You want to do some of that. Um, even if you're kit bashing, depends on how you're doing it. But again, if you're asked, if you're going to be doing something like a major character and you're sort of cheating by just throwing in um, insert meshes for hands, uh, you could shoot yourself in the foot. So it's better to know how to edit hands and or work with a model that already has the hands you needed just as the base mesh and then go from there. Um, because just trying to be like, hey, look, it's done, and just join in insert mesh hands. If you're doing that for like a, a class or, a, or you know, for a, a professor, instructor, and they know what your skill set is, and then they see these incredible hands versus like what the rest of the model looks like or what your hands had looked like last week or this week, they're going to know that you're cheating or that you're, you know, taking a shortcut that makes it look fine for now, but your competency, your ability is actually not there. So you're faking it. You're lying, essentially. So that's not smart. That's not good. Because again, like teachers will tell you, Cheating really screws yourself over more than anyone else. Um, so, yeah, you should learn from... The great thing here is there's a, a, a not a gray area, but a lesson to be learned, which is to learn from the insert meshes. If they're what you want, what you need, and you don't have the time, that's different. But if you can do it and you don't have the time for some reason, and they help expedite the process, that's fine. It's just like what I said before about going to Turbo Squid. But if you uh, do have the time and are expected to create this as an original work by you and you just don't do it, you're really kind of losing the advantage of taking this opportunity or previously preparing for this moment, taking the opportunity to learn from work that was well done, that is what you need or want or want to become. And just even like what I'm doing with, uh, like what I did kind of with the Z-Wrap with the face, take a mesh that already is accurate of what you want to create or is close to, and then put don't Z-Wrap them together because they're still cheating Then you're not even doing the work. But Look at reference, look at photos, and then sculpt a hand and, and match them up. And I can show you how to do this. If you guys want to take some sessions with me, I can teach you how to do this, like kind of what I'm doing here, but for other body parts or forms or whatever, and help you replicate accurate likenesses or, um, you know, basically you're recreating a 3D scan without, you know, true proper photogrammetry or a, scan, a 3D scanner. Um, but there's a lot of times where you either won't have access to one of those. And even if you do, you might still have to edit it. You know, have to edit and clean up that work. So to have this sort of like these neural pathways ingrained in your mind so you know what to do, it's extremely important. So again, it's being able to understand the internal structure of what you're learning, right? Not literally anatomy, I mean, but just the, the, the background knowledge, right? You have to understand how to add and subtract in order to multiply. You know, you have to understand all these fundamentals so that you can, you have to learn to walk so you can run, right? that kind of thing. So it's same analogy. Um, so ultimately, I don't think it's really acceptable to use insert mesh hands unless you have no other alternative and you're already capable of creating hands on your own. But this just helps you expedite the process because you have a tight deadline or whatever, you know, or you just don't want to spend that much time on it and you just want to move on to something else you're more interested in. So anyway, long answer for a simple question. Um, 30,000 euros in Europe. Oh, you're in Europe. Okay, so that's totally different. That's almost double here in the States then, right? Because that's like one in one point whatever is the conversion right now, like 1.5, 1.8, something like that. 
So yeah, that's more like 60 grand here. So that's a little different. But again, I don't know how that translates in euros. Because if 30 euros in Europe is like $30,000 here in the US, then that is crappy. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, not good. Um, Goblin. What is it? Goblin Hero 3. Hello. Exodus, you saying um, we don't need to have starving artists anymore. We need to be paid. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do I need to be an artist to, to do ZBrush? Someone told me I needed to be before I start. I mean, no. I think it helps if you can draw, you know, like anything, like any good, prof like any artistic profession or like musical, the arts, they all layer on basic foundations. Like if you want to become a great um, pianist, I mean, of course, you start with that instrument, you end with that instrument. But if you want to learn music fundamentals, music theory, a great instrument to start with and to have a solid foundation on is you start with the piano. Um because it's hard to really, you can't slur a, a note like you can on a, on a string instrument, like a violin or a guitar. Even guitar is a little easier because you have frets. So that kind of helps you. Kind of Again, it's almost like a cheat. It kind of helps you nail the notes because you you feel the bump. You feel the ridge of the fret. So you know not to go past a certain point or you know you're immediately on the wrong one. But if you, as long as you press hard enough, you hear the crisp, correct note. Same thing on piano. You might hit the wrong note, but it's not going to sound worse or off other than just it's the wrong note. But it still is a crisp, clear sound, right? String instruments like violin... You can slur all over that thing, that whole like neck, and it's just like you can sound horrible. It's like you're strangling a cat. So I and I know this because I took violin as a kid for years, like over a decade. It's horrible. Um, <laughs> I love the sound of the instrument. It's beautiful. I love orchestras with tons of strings. I just suck at. I didn't enjoy playing it. I just didn't find pleasure in it. But I love the sound. Um, took piano too. Took guitar. So um, love guitar most. Enjoy piano a lot too. Um, so anyway. Yeah, fundamentals. So learning to draw is great. If you don't know how to draw, um, drawing is not just, it's the, the point of learning to draw before you do ZBrush or sculpture is not to, uh, you know, it's not, you're not learning something that's that's not directly related. In many ways it is, but what it's helping you do is teaching your mind to understand how to replicate what you see with what you can do with your hand. So that transference of basically doing like an organic photocopy is what you're doing essentially. And then eventually you can stop looking at something and just imagine it and then be able to do that. But that's much more a much more advanced level. I mean, some people can do a pretty good job. It's just like playing by ear. You hear you hear a song and you learn and you figure out how to play it on the piano without ever reading music. But again, it's sort of you're kind of a hack. You could be great at that, and you could be great at composing music from your head and just playing it, performing it, but a true most the the majority of people who are true professionals and who are either even prodigies or just excellent at what they do, they still conquered, whether it was easy or hard for them, they still conquered the fundamentals. So I'd say it's had very helpful to learn how to draw or be some sort of artist prior to ZBrush, just like it is for anything in Photoshop. You can definitely tell too, people who have a natural proclivity and inclination to drawing or creating from their mind or from what they see, and then enter into the digital sphere, you see a profound, um, usually a profound difference in the quality of their work and how immediate, how quickly they get there because they understand what they're looking for and the tool is just their, their medium to get there, right? It's just their vehicle for creating something. They already know how to, they already know how, they know what they want it to look like and how to get it to look like there, how to, to look like what they want. But it's just, oh, dog is sick. One second, sorry.
There we go. Sorry about that little puking episode. Pup got a little irritated in his stomach. Uh, I'm not sure if he licked something wrong or didn't eat much today. I don't know. Hopefully it gets better. Mm. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Where are we at? We are at four. Wow. Already. Man. Sorry. I spent a lot of time just chatting about the industry here and giving you guys some fundamentals and didn't really sculpt too much. I'm sorry. Um, but I got to go for a few more minutes because I was late. So we'll go until about like 4.14 uh, Pacific Standard Time. Sorry, let me get through the last questions here quick. Um, and I'll just try to do a little bit more sculpting. I'm sorry, there's a lot of talking today. More than more than too much sculpting. Um, got the core stream. Couldn't uh, come at a better time. Thank you. Oh, cool. Awesome. Well, Clay Mush, uh, you're welcome. I'm happy I could help. Again, if anybody wants training sessions, please hit me up. Uh, my Instagram is this. Daniel Lion Arts, send me a DM if you'd like to schedule a session. We can get together and do like a nice little uh, video call and we can share each other's screens and get you going. Um, um, Exodus, well, that sucks. Oh, yeah, with my a hole clients, yeah. Um, can we use blockchain and artwork to protect artists? I mean, maybe. I mean, that's kind of what NFTs sort of sort of help do, kind of, sort of. Um, random question. Have you done any podcasts with Game Dev Unchained? No, I haven't. Um, can you triangulate your Z, uh, Z remesh or is the only way to triangulate is by using decimation tool? Yeah, you can't really triangulate something directly in ZBrush um, other than decimation. <clears throat> Excuse me. You probably want to um, you bring it into Maya. You can triang triangulate in Maya. Yeah. Um, like orderly triangulate. You know, decimation is kind of that. It sort of triangulates randomly, just not randomly, but it, it evaluates uh, the surface of a model and triangulates according to giving less polygons, less triangles to wherever there's less detail. So if something's really smooth, it requires, it will just create as many triangles as needed to hold that form so it'll try to reduce that as much as possible and you can you can really push it where it almost creates like a really blocky looking thing like a really triangulated looking faceted looking um object um but yeah so you want controlled triangulation where it just looks at a mesh for instance um like here looking at mr reeves face so like this is uh so that is um my you know uh quadded right that's quads this is triangulation so but this is intelligent triangulation as you can see because you can see where it would form quads and then there's a diagonal stripe you know line going through it edge loop so this is intelligent triangulation which games basically do some of them do their engines or, or programs will do automatically um Sometimes you'll import a, in other words, what you do is you might import a quad quadrangulated model uh, into a, a game engine and it will automatically triangulate, you know, creating uh, diagonal edge loops between points. Uh, so, yeah. Um, um, random question though, any podcasts? No, so I haven't done any podcasts with... Um, I have done a podcast. I need to schedule my other my other um, guests, but I have one already recorded, and I just need to finish editing. I just I just been busy, and now I have some time this week, so I'm definitely gonna probably hop on that right after this, actually. Um, but uh, I interviewed um, uh, a good friend of mine who's also a rather prolific sound designer, Derek Espino. He's a fantastic guy and a very gifted uh, sound designer. He did all the main sound design for. Um, Uncharted, let's see here, um, two, three, and he worked a bit on four, but not as much, and then did a lot of work on The Last of Us, the sound design for that, and um, for my favorite game, The Last Guardian, <laughs> the last, the, the last, The Last Guardian, amazing sound design for that, and um, we get to, we get into some of that, we talk about some of the things he used for um, The Last Guardian in particular, because Trico, the giant griffin creature, sounds incredible and unique and, and it's just there's a lot of cool little little tricks and tips and things he did um sorry just making sure the dog is okay 
All right. Anyway, um, sorry, he's not having a good stomach day apparently. Uh, anyway, um, so yeah, that's coming out soon. I think uh, April is a safe. It's safe to say it's going to come out this month, and I'll line up some other people here already. I already have some guests and friends who've said they've committed, and um, you know, other composers. Uh, I mean, or composers, I should say, um, people who are running certain visual effects houses and training. Um, you know, and maybe we'll upgrade to actors as well or uh, directors. I would love to. I'm a huge fan of writer directors, um, of course, and I'm just a huge movie fan. So there are definitely specific individuals I'd love to speak with. Um, I've been lucky to um, to be in contact with Phil Tippett in the past, and we're still you know acquainted very well. He's always left an open door for me at Tippett Studios whenever I'm in town. Um, and for those who don't know who Phil Tippett is, look up Phil Tippett. Um, freaking amazing. Um, huge positive creative influence in my life as a child and it was such an honor to be able to uh, meet him and know him and and uh, I'm guessing he'd be gracious enough to come on the podcast but I haven't asked him yet but I would like to have a few other you know notable guests so at least to show some credibility um, Ed and Unziata creator back of the Dolphin and a bunch of other video games um, for the Sega Genesis back in the uh, 90s also a good friend and I'm a huge fan of his work of course and a creative hero so we're definitely gonna have him on um, uh, Takeshi Furukawa, another wonderful acquaintance, amazing composer, composer for The Last Guardian. Uh, hoping to have him on as well. Gareth Coker has already said he'd love to come on. Gareth Coker, amazing composer. Ori and the Blind Forest soundtracks. Um, and, and Ark, Survival, you know, just tons of tons of amazing work. Um, maybe we'll get Austin Wintry as well. I've met him uh, once or twice. And really super nice guy as well. Crazy, incredible talent. Um, music for Journey. If you guys have ever played Journey on the PS3 or 4 or 5. <laughs> amazing game, and amazing soundtrack. And he's done so many other works, you know, these are all prolific people. Um, so anyway, uh, lucky to, to have met a lot of them here in LA and they all are local. So, or nearby, um, California. So, um, yeah, so we'll see. So podcasts are coming and the first one should be out this month. Um, yeah. So a lot of things going on. Um, just trying to make ends meet and survive in the meantime. So yeah, um, podcasts are on the way. Uh, theoretically, you could use ZBrush to do the majority of Retapo and then modify it to accommodate animation. Yes, absolutely. And that's what I've done, actually, for a fair amount of, of work that I've done. Um, good morning. Uh, Tau, Char, Ter, Tau Terra, New Zealand? New Z? NZ? Hello? This would be a good afternoon in this case, or good evening, almost, in our case. But yes, good morning. Um, oh, so Polycount Target is in the thousands. Yes. Shin Edward, hello. This is probably hello and goodbye. I'm sorry. Um, you guys are coming in a little late. But unfortunately, this was a lot of talking. I feel bad. I didn't do a lot of sculpting this time. Um, just a lot of basic pointers. But again, um, if anyone's excited to do a session, please let me know. Give me a message. Email me. Whatever. Um, so, yeah. Email. Again. Daniel at flyarts.com. Uh, website. Same thing, lionarts.com. And um, followed on our station. Thanks, the Benjamin. Uh, a Benjamin. Thanks for sharing knowledge and insight. You're welcome, of course. Um, you can also follow me on Instagram. It's probably where I post more frequently. I have a bunch of good work um, that's, you know, I'm proud of or I'm happy with on uh, Art Station, but I don't update it really that often. I should, but it's just a lot. There's my site, my Instagram, Facebook, occasionally Twitter. Um, everything you can find me as Daniel Lion Arts, all one word, pretty much. I'm everywhere as that. Um, Twitch, same thing. Our station feels more um, committal. Yeah, I guess so. Um, anyway, so yeah, so we're, we're reaching the end here. If anyone has any last minute questions, please feel free to let me know. I'll just do a little bit more work here until about, you know, another five minutes or so, and then uh, I'll bounce. But. Um, so the hair here, uh, topology wise, oops, wrong thing. Let's do the hair. I mean, it's okay, except like this right here, like that is kind of a point, an annoying little section right here, right? You don't want to have like this weird diamond shape when you're trying to have like nice flowing hair. So we're going to, and then like over here is another weird, like that's definitely looking funky right there. It's like this kind of star, right? Where it has like one, two, three, four, five arms branching out for one point. It's what we call a star. You don't really want stars and things whenever possible. You have to try to avoid them whenever you can because they just disrupt the proper um, nice edge, edge flow, as we were talking about earlier. You will always have some stars, or it's almost nearly impossible to not have them in the face. 
So if we click on here, um, right here's the star, as you can see, one, two, three, four, five. Um, also see them right here on the nose. And usually, yeah, you have one right on here. Um, and then here and here. So you'll have them in certain places. Um, certain um, topology can do better at getting rid of some of those. Certain edge flow may have a, a better time with it. Here's another head, an alternate head from ZRAP, actually. But here you have a star. There you have a star. Here's a star. There's a star. Everywhere's a star star. Uh, <laughs> you're going to have a lot of stars in the face. It's just the way it goes. So this is pretty idyllic. Um, this is pretty idyllic edge flow. You don't have edge loops around the eyes because you will need the blink and need the compression of those muscles as they, you know, it really follows the flow of how the muscles actually lay in the face. Because if you look at your um, your orbital muscles, right, your ocular muscles here that flow around your orbital socket where your eye is, there's circular muscles that go there just as they do with the mouth, which is how they allow us to move our mouth and eyes in those shapes to do this really hard, to scrunch together, to do very dramatic, right? expressions with the mouth to allow us to enunciate and pronounce correct words or words correctly, unlike my grammar. Uh, <laughs> so um, there's an interesting correlation between the science of designing edge loops for the human face and or creatures in general and how they would deform according to how muscles contract and the muscles, ironically, or interestingly, are in the same form generally, right? Of course, there's deeper tissue muscles, deeper underlying muscles, like your, you know, the muscles that help you chew that actually run from the corner of your mandible and up through the hole here in your, um, what, what was considered your zygomatic bone. They go through there and attach to your temple, right? They go up and through underneath, behind bone and go up through. It's this beautiful, incredibly dynamic, amazing design, amazing system that the human form has and that all living beings, mammals that have similar anatomy have. Um, even dinosaurs and whatnot. They're so radically different, yet their, sy their system of chewing and the jaw motion, it's all very similar. It's a, a direct um, anal analogous line you can see through all living beings that have similar anatomy. Um, even insects have similar internal um, structures that allow them to contract and move. I mean, very different, but still similar. There's still certain functions that just uh, that are universally um, in play. So... Um, so it, while anatomy is important to learn, I think you can also kind of learn it a bit through osmosis, through observation and doing this kind of work. And if you look at your uh, anatomy books, right, or online reference, you're going to find some, you might learn better and faster or more naturally with a more burned in knowledge through doing work and then figuring out why doesn't it look right. And then I'll take you, I'll, I can help you show you, you know, where to find reference or what to research, what to search for what to pay attention to, what to disregard initially, because you can get learn all the deeper tissues, but they won't necessarily help you sculpt better on the surface. There's a certain limit. I found a certain happy medium of what you should know that under underlies the skin versus um, the depth of what you can learn, which could be irrelevant to um, the surface and yeah, the, out, the outer shell, the skin. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot there to, to take in and consider when you're studying anatomy or trying to get better with, human forms, um, and that's that you want to be selective about what you're actually pouring into your mind and what you're giving hierarchy, what you're giving importance to, uh, because there's a lot that you won't necessarily need to know or won't need that information to be in the mind, and it can just kind of cloud um, and confuse you a bit, you know, in, in your perspective of how you're, how you're learning and what you're, uh, what you're actually, you know, prioritizing uh, mentally for, um, um, for usage. So, so it's a lot. And uh, I think like many people, I'll have a unique, I mean, like many other teachers, I'll have a unique way of teaching, but also um, the, the whole system here, it's very personalized, right? We're working together one-on-one. -on -one. It's not like a class where someone's just spewing out lots of generic information and hoping everyone can just keep up or, uh, you know, Tutoring, but I think a friend of mine was like, don't say tutoring because tutoring sounds like it's for children. And I'm like, I've never thought of tutoring as for something for children. She's like, that's what happens when you're in school. And you're, I'm like, that's a you problem. I don't think that's an everyone problem. <laughs> I mean, I don't think of tutoring as anything other than, yeah, I mean, I guess we associate that with school at some point because that's where you first learn what tutoring is and maybe you need some tutoring. But I mean, what are tutorials? <laughs> I mean, we all follow tutorials now as adults, right? Um, it's 
a tutorial. It's tutoring you. Um, so anyway, so it's a personalized approach is, is the whole point here. So if you guys want that, I'm more than happy to help you speed along your journey. Um, and it's cool. Like if you go on my Instagram, like I said, you'll see Tyler is a great example and fast. I mean, that I was blown away just how quickly he got to that point. But he really he just followed what I told him to do. You know, we had a two hour session. And I mean, not even all that two hour session was just teaching and sculpting techniques. It was a lot of how to set up certain things in ZBrush to help you, right? How to find certain tools, gave him lots of tips. He kept telling me like, oh my God, I never knew this before. I never knew that you could do this. I never knew you could do this. Where is that? Oh my God, you know, it's just a lot of discovery for him. And I'm surprised that his teachers didn't teach him some of this, but I, that's where I've become more and more a firm believer that a lot of uh, formal education today in schools are kind of a waste of money. Um, I think you can spend a more a, a much less amount of money and a more concentrated surgical way of learning what you want to learn when it comes to software and the arts especially you don't need to go to a four-year school no one cares where you graduated from you i literally have friends who went to harvard graduated and they're decent painters now and they have a name for them but it has nothing to do with the fact they went to harvard it's a nice possibly pretentious thing to say to somebody to try to impress them to say that you went to a great academic university with, I mean, a great university that's known for its high academics and its achievements and people who've come out of it, but that doesn't make you a better artist, right? No one will care that you went to Harvard and this person just dropped out of high school and got their GED. If that guy's work is amazing just because he focused and learned from good people, from masters or from mentors, and this guy went to Harvard and paid out the ass and his work is kind of shit. Like, who do you think is going to get hired? And where do you think they're going to start your rate at? Like, you know, it's going to be the one who has great work, good portfolio. And the, like the three points I always say, be excellent at what you do, be great with people and be lucky. And lucky is, of course, luck favors the prepared. So if you're prepared, you have the first two down, you have great work to show and you're ready to work and you're ready to demo, perform, act, audition, whatever. And you're really good with people. You're dynamic. You're happy. You're positive. You look people in the eye. You're confident. You're assertive. You do know your shit. You've got it together. All you're doing is just waiting for that opportunity, for that lucky moment, for the elevator pitch, for someone to walk into your life or for you to find them or seek them out and say, hey, I see you're hiring or I don't know if you're hiring, but I, I, I love the work your company does or that you do or whatever. And I'd love to collaborate. I love to offer my services, love to work with you. And they give you that opportunity to apply or show them your work and bam, you're hired. Right. So luck favors the prepared. So to be prepared, be great at what you do and be good with people. It's pretty simple. Um, it's worked for me so far. Anyway, um, let's see. We're reaching the end here. We're a little bit over more of it now. Uh, I've been through two schools, closing, and in my final year at my third school, this makes me feel major senioritis. <laughs> Sorry. Um, get out. Get out now. Run. Um, you're done. I think. Yeah. At this point, I mean, you just need to get the paper. I mean, get the paper. You know, get your degree, diploma, but. Um, you just need to be working on your own stuff, on your own portfolio, making portfolio pieces and honing your skills on pieces that you're excited about. Make pieces that you want to do and be paid for professionally. I always tell you that and it's, it's true. Make the work and show only the work that you would want to do professionally for someone else to be paid for it. If you're doing it on your own and no one's paying you. Because you don't want to do work. You don't want to be hired just because you want money or you need to pay the bills. Yeah, sometimes we do have to take work that we don't like, that we actually even hate or resent, just because we need to eat, we need to pay bills. You know, and hopefully you don't get screwed over like I have a couple of times, like case in point recently. But you um, you don't want to make it a habit of doing work that you absolutely abhor because you're going to grow to hate what you're doing professionally and you've just spent how much time moving in that direction, right? So you want to be able to at least enjoy, if possibly even love. And I'm saying possibly love because... Honestly, there's a lot of work I do that I don't love, but I don't hate it. I actually enjoy it, or I, I really enjoy the end result. Um, but the work I love is like things like this or projects that I'm excited about. That's what I love doing. I love seeing the end result. I love seeing people's reaction to it because I know that the ideas I have or I aim, the taste I've developed for myself would be one of, of excitement and beauty and awe. And I always want people's reaction to my work in general, the work I really love and put my passion into. I want the reactions to either be cursing or speechless, right? Or just like, wow, exclamations. Like I want positive, excited emotion, not anything that would aim to offend or upset or or, or, um, or really depress. 
um, you know, I mean, there's enough negativity in the world. If we can try to put more positivity and more love and more excitement and um, inspiration out there, all the better. I mean, because that's how I became inspired to be an artist and to, to love film and love storytelling. It's thanks to people like Phil Tippett and Steven Spielberg and Michael Crichton and James Cameron and yeah, on and on and on. Um, Peter Jackson, Christopher Nolan. So, yeah. Um, you know, there's no shortcuts to hard work. I remember... Uh, Arnold loves to say that, and it's true. But, you know, maybe get a little less sleep. Sleep a little faster, as he says. And um, and just put more hours and time into your into your work, you know? Even it's not, the phrase, like, work smarter, not harder, is not always doesn't always hold. Because sometimes you can work as smart as you can, and it's still going to be hard work. Um, but what's important is to understand the value of that. Understand that it's leading towards something. And I think working smarter, not harder, also should mean... You're intelligent about how you're intelligent about how you're acquiring and practicing the information that you know will lead to what you want to do. So, being intelligent, seeking intelligence, and smart choices, wise choices, often starts by seeking people who are older and wiser than you. So that's, that's, age doesn't necessarily mean maturity or experience. It tends to lean that way, but it's not always the case. Obviously, you can't have much experience if you're very young and you've just moved out of mom and dad's house like last year or something or you know moved out of their house into a dorm where you're still being coddled by an ra or something you know what i mean or that idea so you really don't have much life experience generally usually um unless you're a prodigy or you're just like you've had some really incredible upbringing um usually though in general most people are going to have a pretty um protected sheltered ish kind of experience especially professionally you're not even sheltered you just don't have a lot of professional experience yet because you haven't been out in the world working um so it's important for you to understand and be able to try to evaluate the people that are coming into your life who are older and more experienced than you and who hopefully have your best interest in mind who aren't looking to take advantage of you or harm you in any way or mislead you or do anything abusive in general and i mean I don't, I don't mean that in any dramatic way i just mean like taking advantage of you to make money you know or um just aren't personable aren't kind those aren't people you really need to learn from necessarily or at least be able to take the skin off the bone metaphorically um Take away what you can from them that's good and, and try not to be influenced by the bad. People who are very hateful, negative, angry, um, who want to make work that um, is, is always antagonistic toward other people. Instead of, you know, you can say the same thing two ways. And if you're saying something out of love and kindness and and compassion versus out of resent, resentfulness, and anger and hatred and animosity, you're going to get two very different results in the end. And of course, I think love and kindness always wins. So, um, or it should anyway. Um can also get steamrolled by angry people too so keep that in mind so protect yourself emotionally protect your mind your heart and be selective about who you learn from how you learn and also be forgiving to yourself um, i think that's really important for a lot of artists to understand that's really fundamental and yet i think a lot of us miss that mark is not to beat yourself up to find that right balance right balance is key to be able to evaluate your work and be critical but not beat yourself up right you don't want that it's pendulum to go too far this way. You want it to be balanced, right? You want it to be tempered. You want to be able to say, this is not good, but it's not good for these reasons, and this is how it can be better. Too many art students get so critical and so like nitpicky about things that you can tell when someone's really green and just fresh out of art school, when they look at a piece of work that you did or someone else did or you were hired to do, so you weren't even doing it like of your own true direction and volition. You were being taken direction. You were being given direction by someone else and just producing what they wanted but they'll look at that work and critique you and say like oh well this isn't that good because of this or oh you know that's nice but this composition could be better like this and they'll always make this like backhanded compliment or like this weird evaluation of your work and you're like child shut up before i smack you <laughs> like no one asked you first of all secondly it wasn't like my choice most of the time it was like i was taking direction from a client so i made what they wanted because i'm making money what are you doing like <laughs> for this work you know so um you know, and you, of course, being mature also realize that, you know, in this industry means you, you don't take offense to those things because you have to understand that they don't know any better. And they're just sort of coming off of being told to be critical, right? A lot of our art professors would say like, all right, everyone critique each other's work and let's put it all up, the drawings up on the wall and give everyone a critique, you know? So being kind and constructive is, is also a, a skill that should be learned and should be taught. Um, and so I think having that right amount of compassion and balance and how you approach and evaluate your own work being willing to forgive yourself for making mistakes is important. Um, it's very important for your mental health as an artist so you don't become depressed or um, angry. Um, so yeah, so anyway, I'm sorry, I'm just sort of spitting out random 
random thoughts here about about the process but i'm just trying to remember like what it was like when i was much younger and and just venturing out into this world and figuring out the art world and figuring out where i wanted to be and finding my place and finding my medium you know what what medium of work whether it's sculpture or drawing or photoshop or graphic design or you know how would i use it, visual communication what do i love about film could i be a director should i be a writer you know, should I even think about even acting a little bit or like, how should I pantomime something to get the pose right? You know, there's so many different areas where you could fall into them and either find that you don't like them or you do, but maybe you like something else better. And or like, then if you don't like it or you fail in some area or someone mocks you or laughs at you for something, don't take that to heart. You know, there's all these different things that just chaos that happens along your journey. Um, and I think some people um, won't have as much confidence or assertion in who they are, or who they want to be. And they might let themselves be affected and negatively in impacted by other people who are just uh, kind of rude and inconsiderate. And maybe they may not even mean it that way. It's just they just are brash. They just come off a certain way. So anyway, um, I digress. But yeah, just just mental vomit here for you guys for hopefully useful vomit. Um, anyway, um, can you get me an internship somewhere? A <laughs> model to show. I cannot get you an internship anywhere, unfortunately. Um, I mean, I could. I could possibly recommend you somewhere down the road if I know some places looking for a junior artist. Um, but, you know, send me any messages you want via email or my Instagram and I can try to do what I can, but I, I won't promise anything because oftentimes a lot of young people will ask working artists to recommend them somewhere. And if you don't know the person, you can't really vouch for them. So, I mean, if the opportunity comes up where someone says, hey, we're looking for a junior artist to do blank and, you know, you're a professional person that I can assert, you know, I can figure out. I'm pretty good with figuring people out. I'm pretty good at picking up on people very quickly and smelling out BS and liars and psychos pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> um, but it's hard for those of us who are a bit more senior to recommend someone who's just coming out into the industry unless they're extremely competent. We've known them personally somehow and they can vouch that they're, you know, a decent person and, and won't slack or, or won't... Um, just be more of a problem, you know what I mean? Because it could be bad for you too. It could be a bad experience if you're thrown into a deep end and you can't really swim yet. So, I mean, it really, it really depends. But if you have a good portfolio put together, it's not just about one model, you know what I mean? That That's great. I'll be happy to look at it. But one model is not going to get you in any doors. Not really. Um, because they need to see that you can do a variety of things competently and that you have some sort of history of work, even if it's not professional, but just a portfolio of work that shows some variety. Um, even if you want to be just a creature artist or you want to be a hard surface person, you at least have to have multiples of that department, of that genre or that style, right? To be able to, um, to be able to show that you are, um, you know, able to take direction, flexible and efficient at what you do and are, you know, modeling properly. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can send me whatever you want and I can take a look at it and at least give you some pointers. And, uh, you know, I mean, I'm more than happy if I think of someone and I see a link for something. For someone that's looking for an internship or they're looking for a junior artist or whatever, I'm more than happy to, you know, send work your way or send uh, links your way to apply to different places. Um, but that's like that's really the best that's the most power I have because I'm I'm not with any particular studio currently, so I don't really have my in anywhere to be like, hey, look for this person, you know. But um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's all about networking too. You know what I mean? Like I have a lot of friends in all a bunch of different places, and of course I could pass a name on to them if they're looking for someone. But again, it's all about evaluating too. Like, who is their artist, and what's their work look like, and how long have they been doing their work, and are they good with people? Are they a team player? Can they be on time? You know, all those professional um, parameters. So, um, yeah, it's all paid for by transfer grants. Nice. I'll beef my portfolio up. I'm being a little confused. Okay, gotcha. Absolutely. I have three high poly pieces um, so far. Everything else is class made props. Gotcha. Sage words. <laughs> as long as the work can also help you with your overall skill set. That's important too. Yeah, absolutely. Dig your velocity after three minutes. Oh, thanks, man. Thank you. Yeah, there's going to be a new one coming out soon for an NFT. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be fun. Um, I have 100 gigabytes of RAM. Actually, yeah, I have 128 gigabytes of RAM. This is a beast machine. I built a pretty heavy-duty machine to do video editing and do all this kind of work, rendering, excuse me, doing work on in Unreal. You know, wanted to be able to run high-end models in Unreal because I'm learning Unreal. So, um, yeah. 
trying to go for the Unreal Fellowship. I'm trying to, I got to bug Mr. Someone over there uh, to uh, see if I can get in on the uh, Fellowship. Because I really could just use that time to just commit to just Unreal. And um, take some time off to just really pour into it. And um, finish uh, my knowledge in there to do my short film. Which I'm doing all in Unreal. So, yeah. Always learn new stuff, man. Always keep up to date. I think Unreal, VR... 3D printing, AR, those are all still really nascent, hot um, items. And NFTs, learning how to make NFTs, um, you know, which is making your art crypto, basically. Um, it's always to make, you know, multiple streams of income. You know, it's like you want multiple streams and as many multiple passive streams of income as you can get. So you just got to be smart. Being an artist, it's, you got it. So many artists are just great at art and not good at business. And you need to become better at business. And I'm speaking to myself, too. Um, but you know, I feel like I'm becoming more aware of that later in life. And I wish I would have known that and thought about that and been more proactive about that when I was like 18, 19, 20, you know, but at that point I was just leaving the hospital and working in the ER for years and thinking like, do I want to do art? You know, really kind of taking a whole like kind of 90 degree turn or 180 from, from the sciences in a lot of ways, but anatomy is like, you know, overlap there for sure. But, um. Anyway, uh, yeah, it's a mess. What's your opinion on people changing careers to game dev? Um, fine, you know. I mean, if that's what you want to do, I mean, we're learning three D right now is 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 you know a great gateway into that, you know. So it depends what you want to do in game development. Game, de game development is so big. I mean, you have coders and programmers and artists and sound designers and actors and mocap actors and animators and riggers and texture artists i mean there's so many disciplines in the creative field that come together and art directors and writers you know if all these disciplines it's like a movie plus more in a sense um you know so you've got a lot of options in game dev it's like where do you want to go in game dev what do you want to do do you know you know maybe you might like something else more you know so there's a lot of variety there's a lot of a lot of um choices you know um any tips to avoiding, preventing, and dealing with burnout? Do pieces you love. Take time off. Find a way to make and or save enough money to be able to take time away in between either gigs or if you're doing freelance, which a lot of people do. Or if you um, are working at a company, start looking for another one maybe. you know, Or start looking to change to part-time. Or you need personal time. That's the way to avoid burnout is personal time. Whatever that is. Whether it's going out and taking a dance class or going out for a run on the beach or um, going for a run around the block. You know what I mean? Like time where you're not feeling guilty. And I'm speaking for myself, too, which is hard to find as an artist, especially as a freelancer, when you're always just trying to make ends meet. And you're just loving what you're enjoying, what you're doing, but you still would rather do something else. That's like, I mean, another project, even like my own. Like, I love doing this. Like, I want to finish Neo. I want to finish this awesome piece because I think it's going to be you know, badass and, and spectacular. I'm excited about it, but I have to do other work to pay my bills, you know, and right now I'm looking for more work right now. I'm in between gigs. So it's a little stressful and annoying. Um, so I'm hitting up my contacts I'm sending out emails I'm calling friends and people and, you know, um, it's just the life of an artist. It's not an easy life. So you got to be prepared for that, too, unless you're going to, you know, you're going to sacrifice that flexibility, that freedom and that personal autonomy to be with a company, which I I might be well, I've done. I've done here and there, but I'm also glad when they like downsize and they're like, all right. We're letting like this whole department go or like six of you are gone. Who wants to go? You know, or like, we're not going to let you choose. We're just letting you all go here. I'm okay with that usually because after like a year or six months or three months, even if it's a really rough, rough environment, um, most of the time I'm okay. I'm okay with it. I'm like, all right, no, I don't really care. Like, you know, it's, never, it's usually, almost never, it's never been like you're fired because you're not doing a good job. It's just always like, all right, well, the, the gig's done. We extended you for another movie or two, or if I'm lucky and, and now we're, we're, you know, we're going to have to downsize the department. So, you know, if I'm not a staffer, if not someone who got hired staff, usually you get paid more as a, as a freelancer. But it's also because your work, it's like you burn out quickly, like a firework. You know what I mean? Like you spike here, you get your hot work done, and then you're, you're, you're off the job. And that's usually fine for me because I like variety and I like seeing all these different places. And I've yet to really find a company that I'm like, I want to work for that company forever. Like, I really want to, I'm my own man. I want to do my own thing. I want to make my own films. That's what I really want to do. So... But if you're somebody who's happy to work for another company and just produce, you love the content they make and you want to just be a cog in the machine, and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, I just mean that that's what, you, what you're content with, which a lot of people are, and you love the products they make and you love the brand that they make and you just want to be a part of it, go for it, you know? Um, that's not my that's not my desire, right? I need to find investors. <laughs> I need to find people who want to like help me create spectacular art that has meaning and value and, and 
solid morals and yet is also badass and spectacular um so i'm I'm in a different i'm on a different path than most and it's a more high risk high reward kind of path but it's also a very personal one um personal and yet also i understand how to make spectacular commercial appealing products you know or, or films and stories and that kind of thing so it's um but it's a challenge you know it's it's really you always like you've got all this resistance and or it, people are ignoring you until you make something until you finally show them what you can do and then all of a sudden they all just want to like eat you they just want to oh my god you're the best thing ever come over here and we'll, we want to represent you or we want to work with you or we want this to you know it becomes like a, it's like oh god you know it's like sycophantic then this one extreme or the other you're a nobody and then suddenly when they see all you can do they're like oh my god it's annoying it's irritating because you're like man where were you when i needed you you know what i mean now it's like i have so many options it's like i got i can pick and choose once you get to that point but then before that you're just struggling and you're like you know but that's part of the game i guess that's part of the the journey you know like james cameron was sleeping on people's sofas and like having his mom clip out and send him coupons for like buy one get one free burgers so he'd buy one burger with that coupon and then have enough money to just to pay for one burger and save the second one in the fridge for like cut it up in two pieces and eat one one day and eat one the next day like, he was struggling man i mean that's like that's struggling that's way worse than where i'm at um but man last year was rough so um just know it's like the artist path is not for the weak it's not for the faint of heart it's not for the weak stomached um you've got to have a plan of some type and it doesn't mean you have to stick to that plan like glue but you should have you know, a game plan, a strategy, a basic idea of where you want to go, how you're going to make money, how you're going to manage your money, how you're going to invest it so that it gives you more return, whether it's obviously investing in a good computer, some good gear, some courses, some training, some mentoring, um, you know, whatever you need, you got to figure that out. And that's, that's really important for a lot of artists starting out is in that means also you might have to take jobs you don't like. I've done that a lot before I started working professionally solely as an artist landscaping, waitering, fine dining, um, ER. I worked in the ER for like two years. And then I worked in another ER for like almost a year doing clerical work because I was sick of clinical work. And then I was like, nah, I like like interact with patients more. Um, so I did like a geriatric care after that, like in-home nursing care, which got depressing because they all died. ER, it's like live or die quickly, but you know. Um, <laughs> so I kind of went from the frying pan into the fire, um, but uh, emotionally. But um, so, you know, I've done my share of work. So I got my hands figuratively and literally dirty um in a good way you know what i mean for the benefit of others of course and or landscaping you know what i mean but um you've got to just make ends meet sometimes so I've, I've paid my dues in that department probably more than many um doing doing rough jobs and you know stuff is blue collar like even like industrial lawn mowing at one point when i was like just out of high school um or in high school but you know what i mean like you did you just got to find your path and you got to make ends meet and it will never look like this beautiful, clean, linear line and path into success or, or to achievement. It's always going to be that squiggly, crazy road leading to, you know, where you want to be. So anyway, sorry, I've talked way too much and not sculpted enough this time. I'm sorry, but I hope this was helpful for people. Please give it a thumbs up. <laughs> Please give the video a thumbs up um, if you like what you've heard and it's helpful. Because I think while I know some people may be watching this and have expected sculpting a lot, um, I also want to say that I, I think that there's a lot of um, dialogue that's not happening that needs to about the business side of being an artist and the realities of what you're getting yourself into and what a lot of people do not know. A lot of young people don't know when they're going to school and they're paying for school for art school. And um, the schools just want to make money. The schools are a business. So you have to realize you're already being taken advantage of in a sense that way. Um, this industry and these softwares all move quickly, move extremely nimbly. They're extremely agile in how they develop and how they change. The industry itself is, in a, is a very, it's a moving target. So you've got to be on the cutting edge. And that means often, more often than not, like 80 to 90% of the time, most schools with probably, maybe I guess the exception of like Nomen, because they have all industry people teaching there and, and they're people who are working currently or have worked for a long time in the industry. Um, most schools are gonna be behind the curve. You know, and the way you stay ahead of it is taking courses online, whether they're pre-recorded or not, or with live tutors. And I did that. That's I'm speaking from experience too. That's how I got where I am. It was like, you know, the now defunct Zebra's workshops. Um, that you know, I learned a lot, and I learned from a very personable group of people, um, to a degree. And uh, then I started working with them. I was hired to work with them. Then after that, so um, figuring out that is a real trick too. That's a real trick. It's like getting paid 
to um, getting paid to learn. You know, like being, if you imagine if you, instead of paying school, you were being paid to study at school because you were helping the school. That's basically exactly what I, what I had, I hacked, I figured out, and I was lucky to fall into, I guess. Um, but it's because they saw us professional and also coming from, you know, a, a strong, different profession, medicine, um, makes you very, it make it, like, especially ER, you have to learn how to relate to criminals and you have to learn how to relate to PhDs. You have to, I mean, like bring your cops, bring in criminals. You got to work on the criminal guy with a gunshot wound, right? Um, GSW, you know, or you got drunk drivers coming in, you have drug addicts, you have drug seekers, um, people in mental health, you know, it's just all kinds of, you have to deal with all types of people. So, you, you know, I was going to be a doctor, so I had to learn how to interact with all these people in a mature, professional manner and be able to extract information from them. You know, what's your pain like? Where is it coming from? What you do? So on and so forth. So that helped a lot. So but again, I'm saying this not to brag or as a humble brag or anything like that. I'm saying this because these are facts that led me to where I'm at. And it will benefit you to gain those those abilities too, to foster you know, being professional, being fun, being positive, finding that balance of being a fun professional that people love to see and talk with, yet you still get your work done and they really enjoy being with you, being around you, working with you, speaking with you, whatever. That will just take you far in life, period, whether it's in the arts or any other profession. Um, finding that zone, right? It's finding some sort of charm, some sort of charisma in life in a way and being authentic with it though, because when you're fake, and you're just this fake kind person, this fake whatever. You're an act. You're a bad actor. Is what you are. And people see right through that. Even if they can't articulate it very directly or specifically, they'll feel it. And people more than anything remember how they make you feel, even more than what they might say or do. It's what you're you're walking away with. What emotion you're walking away with some from somebody is what they'll remember and what their gut and their heart will make them resound and feel and re retain. So that is a huge life lesson that I think everybody needs to think about more than, you know, be told to be aware of more than what they are, if at all. Um, so, yeah, anyway, man, we're almost at five. So I got to go. I'm sorry. I'm just I'm blabbering here. Um, but I hope this was helpful. I think this is all va really I'm giving you this information because I think it's honestly valuable and it's, it's all free here, you know, but it's stuff that will really help any uh, younger artists or younger professionals in general trying to enter into um a new world of work and now with online being the majority of has been at least for a long a lot of states the majority of uh how you interact with people you've got to be a good communicator and authenticity being a genuine human being being an honest no bs person that will be a huge thing too right so that's that's just things to focus on things to think about and it's all personal it's all like between you and yourself and whoever else you're interacting with you know Ask questions of people you trust, like ask your friends or family or whoever you um, you trust. They would be honest and compassionate in how they deliver their critiques of how you interact with people or things you might say or do that are habits, you know, habitual things. Um, ask them for areas you might be able to improve on. Because we only see throughout our eyes. You know, we see out through our eyes in our inner mirrors. We don't see ourselves from the third person. We never see how we are unless you record yourself as like an actor, you know, unless you have a, a camera running 24-7. Um, it's good to ask someone who can be kind in their um, suggestions or recommendations for how you might want to um, modify or, or mature your, um, you know, conduct in the world professionally and, and creatively. So anyway, um, um, sorry, I was just looking through all this last couple of stuff. Uh, ch -ch -ch Main concern is crunch and low pay, imposter syndrome. Yep, I hear you. Fully qualified architect with a building-based portfolio. Oh, awesome. Sorry, I missed some of this. I'm sorry. Um, time and energy, most valuable, commonly. Yeah. So that's awesome. You're an architect. All right. Um, yeah, crunch and low pay and imposter syndrome. Yeah. No, I mean, you shouldn't worry about imposter syndrome. You can... If you're an architect and you know good building design, like you could definitely benefit. I mean, the game industry could benefit from someone like you for sure. Absolutely. And then if you had some stylization to that, boom, like, you know, you've got a whole new angle that not a lot of people have. And the fact that you're an actual architect, that's your background. Solid. Definitely. You've got marketable background already. You've got a marketable skill set. You just got to give it some power, some color, some flair, some pizzazz, you know, <laughs> give it some real life and energy and excitement and, just add some things here and there to like building style, like architectural style, whatnot, and you'll really, 
you'll really amp it up, man. You'll nail it. Um, pretty nice art station you got. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm at least kind of permanent employed for now. The whole COVID. That's awesome. Throughout my career, I was having the back of my head. What would the game dev be like, I guess? Yeah. Nothing wrong with landscaping, baby. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, landscaping architects make bank. <laughs> yeah. Um, really makes you reassess people doing non-career jobs. Yeah. So, for sure. So fast. You have to be learning all the time, it seems. Uh, Christ, you actually worked on Trico. Uh, I mean, I worked on... Yeah, I mean, I made the 3D print of Trico. I mean, I wish I would have worked on the game. I didn't. I really wish I would have because I love the game so much. Um, but I'm making a short film based on it. So I'm going to make an animatable game res, but like super high film res, really. Um, Trico, yeah, for my short. Big reveal at the end, though. Just Trico shows up really at the end. Um, but um, anyway, uh, you guys will see eventually when I get it done. <laughs> um must be real nice, very cool. Oh, the Japan studio looks like it's pivoting away from all that. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on over there exactly, but yeah, I wish I worked there, but I didn't. I wish I was a part of that that game. Uh, yeah, thanks and take care. Thanks, Comic Legend. I appreciate it. Same to you. Um, what's your favorite render engine and your expertise in it? Uh, fave. I mean, because it's easy, fast, and looks great. Key shot. Uh, but Unreal's quickly coming up here too. Unreal's pretty awesome. I I, I just did one piece for, that was in a magazine. Um, I'll post it up somewhere. Maybe on my fave. Maybe on um. Uh, Instagram and eventually my site, I guess. It's like a piece that, again, I was art directed to do, so I'm not exactly like super proud of it, but the clients loved it and they were really excited about it and they want to work with me again. Took up a whole two page, I mean, they were asking me to make a whole two page spread for it. It's a lot of environmental design from Utah using mega scans, um, Quixels mega scans, and uh, custom models I made of dogs and a uh, a uh, free model of a base, uh, basic Aston Martin that I did a bunch of editing to, to make it a convertible. It's a Bond theme, it's kind of what they're going for, dog Bond themes. Guard Dog is the name of this um, uh, physical VPN device. So anyway, I'll post it up on <clears throat> Instagram here in a couple of days and you guys can check it out. Not my best work, but it's because I was directed to make it the way it is, not because I really had much choice. So case in point, a good example of what we were talking about today, very apropos. Um, I mean, I love the look of, of Arnold and uh, V-Ray, but I just, I didn't do a lot of work in V-Ray. I've probably only worked, actually, one studio, I did some work in V-Ray, you know, like setting up materials and evaluating how lights look and all that. But I had, I won't lie, I mean, I had some good help too. I had someone who was really an expert in V-Ray helping me and giving me pointers. So that being said, I do not know V-Ray as well as other people do. And I mean, it's sort of like I should kind of, but I don't have to because... I'm not really a look dev person. I'm not necessarily doing that. I am more the creator of the asset and creating all these UV maps and textures. And then I hand it off to other people to do more of that work. You know, I'm not rendering it typically um, as far as for final, you know, composite for a film. So um, I'm the guy making the work that they, you know, put into everything else. Um, watched Matrix Loaded the other day and thought of you. <laughs> awesome, Lemon Cat. Uh, the Zion dance party scene in VR. <laughs> you remember I'm human. Hilarious. Yeah, right? I mean, because we haven't been that close to people in a long time. And it's like, just having a friend over now visiting me, she's vaccinated. But I'm like, even if you weren't, I'm not afraid. I'll take, I mean, I'm pretty sure I had COVID last year and I'm fine. I got over it. it sucked. Turned into bacterial pneumonia, but I got better. I have antibodies. Um, I'm just not. I'm just like, dude, I want human contact. You know, and I'm, I've been so healthy. I've been so healthy since I got sick. I've been so good. Over a year now, just not even a sniffle. So um, anyway, it's just nice to have new new faces to see and people to hug and talk with and just be human again. Yeah, I miss, I've missed that a lot. I really have. And I'm not even an extroverted person. I'm a very talkative person, but I'm a very introverted person, meaning I get my energy from working on my own stuff. And a lot of a lot of people who aren't kind or intelligent really bore me and I don't have much patience for them. So that's why I need to struggle. And you probably need to be a little bit more gentle and compassionate with people who I don't necessarily have anything to say or in common with. Um. <laughs> So there's a lot of general public that I'm like, mm, I'm okay with not being <laughs> interacting with them. But, you know, if I miss interacting with kind, intelligent, professional, you know, active people. I miss that a lot. And so it's bad when the loner is even lonely. Like, you know, it's bad. So I think it's, we need to all be um, getting back to normal. We all need to be getting back to um, regular life and normal human civility and interaction. It's, it's needed. It's, it's part of life. It's part of existing healthy. Um, all right, I've really got to go, guys. Here, I got a few minutes before, um, what's his name starts. Um, 
Where can you link the folio if you don't mind? Oh, where can I link the folio? Oh, email me, please. Um, Iron Sonic, please email me. Uh, Daniel at lion-arts.com. Mostly 3ds Max renders, but it's architectural and not game engine. Um, how do Quixel make mega scans? I mean, they have drones and they have a lot of photogrammetry and scan. They do a whole combination of different things. V-Ray Little Rough, yeah. Would be good to have feedback. Sure. Neo by Matrix, yes. Um, all the expos are closed due to pandemic. Yeah, I know. I missed that. Went to E3 in 2017 last. Yep. Real wicked. Yeah, I went to all the E3s since whenever it was, they allowed it. Like 2014, 2015. So it was a good couple runs for sure. I missed it. I missed it. Um, I missed SIGGRAPH too. And uh, Zebra Summit. Zebra Summit was great. I missed that as well. Uh, real wicked. Hey, Daniel, are you offering classes for Zebra? Yes, I am. Joe Die. Yes, I am. Please, yeah, guys, if you want to send me anything, a portfolio uh, for critique, an image, whatever, email me at daniel at lion-arts.com and or DM me at IG, Instagram. I'm at daniel lion arts. Send me a message there, either one, and I will get back to you. And uh, yeah, you can schedule lessons. We can schedule sessions together if you want to do some private tutoring training. Or you just need some whatever, you know, you want to send me something just as a quick little critique, like a portfolio review or whatever. Um, if you want a full on big portfolio review and like career advice and all that, that'll be a session. So that'll be like an hour or two. Um, but otherwise, if you just want something quick and short, like, I don't mind just doing those little things. But uh, yeah. So and again, if you, you know, you go for a session with me and you have a good time, you have something good to say, and you recommend, you give me a testimony and like some nice compare of images of before and after, like before you took a session with me and after, like what I just did, what I posted right now on my Instagram, my most recent post, I'll give you a, a pretty good discount on another session in the future um, for the next one. So yeah, so there's an incentive to, um, to have a session if you could benefit from what you think I could teach. And, uh, and then there's a benefit to say something nice, because then I'll help you save some money in the next one. So yeah. All right, anyway, it's almost five. I got to go because they have to have someone else stream. So anyway, thanks, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for hanging out. And for those in the future who are upset that I didn't sculpt more, I'm sorry. I will do more sculpting next time, I promise, which will be, I think, either next Tuesday or next Sunday. I got to check the calendar. Um, probably this coming Sunday, I think. But maybe it's next Tuesday. Who knows? Um, follow my Instagram for updates on everything. And uh, yeah, give this video a thumbs up, please. Leave a nice comment or if you have a question in there. Leave it down in the comments on YouTube as well. Um, yeah, stay, health, stay healthy, stay safe. Get outside, get some sun, breathe some fresh air, go for a run. Try to stay happy. <laughs> anyway. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Take care. And uh, yeah, I'll see you later.